Okay, restart the session, please. In this third table, we are talking about surgery, okay, treatments. Okay, our first speaker will be Dr. Marta Guillén from Madrid. And uh, if it technically is possible, we, we start with uh, the talk. Perfect. Okay. Please, whatever you want. So, hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanted to, to say thanks uh, to the organization for this kind kindly invitation to this Congress, to this early Congress, because it is uh, first at back to school. <laughs> it's really, really the first. And uh, my lecture in the program said, uh, which is the best technique in ACL reconstruction? But I, I have uh, taken uh, the liberty to change a little bit. Uh, firstly, because I think that uh, there is not only one technique that works perfectly always. And uh, secondly, because in, in the... Um, in the Clinica Centro with I, where, where, where I work, uh, our team uh, has a wide experience in the ACL reconstruction. Uh, and in fact, this, this, if those are the, the figures of the ACL injuries every year in the world, uh, we can see that one in every uh, 15 procedures of ACL reconstruction uh, is performed at Clinica Centro. So this give us a big experience in the treatment, so uh, I think that maybe I'm here today speaking of ACL reconstruction because of this. Uh, so I am going to, to speak about our fabric technique. Uh, about uh, mechanism of injury, uh, we have listened many this morning, um, Brian, brilliant of my college. Uh, only uh, to add that uh, for us, I feel that it's very frequent to be a self-injury. Uh, and sedon uh, is, is an isolate uh, injury of the ACL. Uh, mostly, uh, the most frequent are the meniscus or the chondral lesions that are associated to the ACL. And we need to treat both, not only the, the ACL, because the patient goes to return to play. For example, if we have this, uh, this patient with an ACL acute, a lesion and chondral lesion in both condyles, lateral and medial of the femoral condyles. So we, uh, in this case, you can see here the, on, the, on the left, the ACL tear here, and uh, how was the chondral lesion and many, many fragments. So this uh, patient uh, couldn't return to play with this uh, chondral lesion. Uh, in this first surgery, we make the ACL reconstruction and we took uh, some biopsy of uh, chondrocytes uh, because we sent those uh, to laboratory, they culture the chondrocytes, and in a second surgery, when the patient, the range of motion of the knee was complete, that it takes about two months, we make an open surgery to, 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 put the, to make the open implantation of both membranes in both condyles. You can see here the MRI one year later with the ACL reconstruction and the recovering of the uh, chondral lesions. And this patient returns to play, was a, um, a basketball player. And what's the real problem with the ACL tear? That it is a lesion that uh, produces a functional inability uh, uh, to practice the sport, to play sports. And the, the patients know it, knows, knows and has many, many questions to ask us. And now I am going to try to answer or to solve some of them. First of all, could be, will my knee be stable after surgery? This is a normal um, ask question to, to make from the patient. Uh, so uh, here we can see that uh, uh, we, ha we, we need to keep in mind that a clinically insignificant one millimeter uh, uh, laxity is, can be missed, but the patient is uh, asymptomatic. Other question will be, will I be able to return to, to sports after ACL surgery? It's difficult to find this data in, in series and in papers. 
but there is one of USA that say that 70% could return uh, to play in, in that series. The next question, we was really a little bit talking about this in, in this morning. Uh, is the level in the future of my knee the same that after the ACL reconstruction? This is some question that maybe the patient don't want to ask because he's afraid of the, of the answer. And this is a level one of evidence uh, in this paper that say that this miss it uh, until four degrees in a scale mass. So maybe uh, it's, it's not difficult to return at the same level. Uh, about the question about the physiotherapy after ACL, I have that is not, uh, it, it, the question is not uh, difficult. The answer is always. And I think that it's important to keep in, in contact with the physical therapy because this is necessary to a good response of the patients. What about knee braces? At, there is a, a level one evidence. Uh, we can say with, with this uh, level of evidence that uh, the routine use of them is not necessary, but everybody use them. No problem, Klaus, don't worry. <laughs> and we know about uh, which factor, factors are uh, the ones that give us poor results. Of course, body mass index, maybe smoke in USA is, is something that they talk ab a lot about this, and uh, allographs. But uh, it's a real risk that we know that is going to be of osteoarthritis after ACL reconstruction, when the ACL is isolated lesion, uh, it could be between zero uh, and 13 uh, percent. But when meniscus tear is associated to the ACL tear, uh, it could be until 48 percent. And uh, sometimes we have many discussions about if the surgery must be in acute moment or we have to wait. This is a paper that uh, give the best results uh, in athletes, in competitive athletes, when they made the surgery in the two first dates. A more technical aspect of the lecture uh, would be talk about the graphs. Uh, we have many, many options of graphs uh, to make the reconstructions. And uh, we know that maybe the ideal uh, substitute of ACL, it doesn't exist. The literature said us that uh, if we, we can uh, make the, 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 the selection of the source between auto or allographs, and they say that maybe with autographing in, in young people, we will get uh, less problems or better results. Between patellar tendon and hamstring, uh, with a level of evidence one, uh, they, this paper said that there is no difference. Uh, although uh, they say that the donor zone is worse in patellar tendon, as everybody knows. In our experience, at first surgery, we use a, a hamstring and we uh, preserve the allografts in the rescue. In our technique, uh, there is uh, a peculiarity that we preserve the tibial attachment. That means that we only uh, make the graphic section at the femoral tunnel and we think that it's important because we preserve the vascularity and maybe this uh, can be produced a better proprioception in the recovery of the knee. Here we have some images uh, of taking the graph with the tibial distal insertion. Uh, we use the epicondyle as the reference to, to the length of the graph. And we like to shoot to, uh, to be a compact graph uh, before being uh, introduced by tunnels. Uh, this is a surprising discovery that we get in a patient that has a, a, a regeneration of the semitendinosus and gracilis after, after uh, being used. Uh, this is the patient uh, in 1986. This is uh, the x-ray with the staples that this time it was the fixation used. Uh, and uh, in uh, 203 has a new lesion of the knee and has in the MRI, in the sagittal, you can see here, and in the axial cuts, 
you can see the semitendinosus and gracilis regenerated. So in this case, 70 years after the surgery, the first surgery, we made the second one, and this was the, the graph that we get of the same uh, hamstring. And what about the tunnels? Uh, tunnels uh, in medicine, like in all ways, there are fashions or tendons. And I think that double tunnel could be in a moment uh, something that we feel as very important, but uh, with the time, I think that a double tunnel maybe is a double problem. So at the moment, we prefer to you don't use them. There is something important in patients that has recurvatum about the tunnels. If you have the recurvatum of the knee, uh, we used to put the tibial tunnel a little bit posterior because we need to preserve the extension of the both knees, very similar. And anyway, we find that some people, uh, some patients has pain after ACL surgery. Literature give us many, many reasons for this. But the really question is that we are using a tendon to substitute a, a ligament. And this is because maybe we believe in ligamentization. But is the ligamentization possible? You can see here an ACL, a normal ACL in an arthroscopy. And this is a, a ACL reconstruction eight years later. If you look at this, it looks a tendon. It doesn't look a ligament. And it works. This patient was not a ligament problem. But we took a biopsy, and the pathological anatomy said us also that is a tendon. So maybe if we, have, if we want to improve the results of the ACL surgery, maybe we need to research. Uh, we need to maybe think in cells to improve this, this change. And just for finish, I want to show you this this uh, technique, uh, this video, that has some uh, details of the technique that, that we use. This is the surgical planification with the approach that we use. We, should, we use to explore again in, surgery, in the operating room, the knee, and uh, we take the uh, graph of the hamstring. Like you see in the video, the firstly, we take the semitendinosus. You can, we use a tenotomus for this to cut the proximal insertion. And after the, secondly, we take the gracilis with the same technique with the uh, tenotomus. Here we have the two tendons that we can uh, put as four tendons, and this is uh, the preserve, the insertion, the tibial insertion that we preserve uh, and clean the muscle, the resource muscle of the tendons. To measure the length, we use the picondyle reference, and here we are uh, suturing the, the, the graph to be very compact because we like uh, to be compact uh, before um, uh, being passed through the tunnels. We have to measure the thickness that we need for the posterior drill. And we uh, take care to be uh, in as a pocket, protected while uh, the arthroscopy time. In the arthroscopy time, we see the ACL in the proximal rupture from the top. We take out the rest, the section, to see the exact point where we want to put the tunnels. We need to clean in tibial and in the notch, in femoral side. And then we use uh, guides for femoral and tibial uh, tunnel uh, using a wire, but always with the arthroscopy uh, control. Don't forget to do it a little bit posterior if you have a recurvating uh, knee. With the femoral, we make the same with the wire. And after we uh, make his the control of arthroscopy of the uh, right posi position of the femoral tunnel, it must be posterior. And after we like to drill in two times because the, that uh, trick uh, add us to, to change a little bit posterior or anterior as we see. Then we used to clean the, the, the corners to, uh, to, 
to have less uh, stress feeding. And we use this guide to pass through the tunnels from the tibial to the femoral. And with a suture, now we are recovering the graft and we are passing the, the graft from tibia, like <coughs> here in the video, to the intercondyle area and through the femoral tunnel. Then we give the, the tension and we only to put the fixation in the femoral side because in tibial we have no problems with, with the fixation. This is the contour arthroscopy of the tension and of the movement. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marta. We talk uh, now. The next speaker is Dr. Alvarez, Pedro, our friend, and he can talk with about uh, another type of surgery. Please, Pedro. Thank you, thank you. First of all, I thank to Medi and Institute Cugat to invite me. And this is my talk, anterolateral reinforcements, when, why, and a third question is what. It's a hot topic now for orthopedic surgeons. We dedicated and sports medicine. This is our, our team, my disclosures. And this is the GOT, the ACL lesion. Some, some data, small data. Look at this, 80% of patients risk of subsequence uh, risk or rupture of ACL, but the most important, the graft rupture rates uh, range 10 to 48%. Uh, percent. Uh, another data, uh, this is systematic analysis with, uh, we look it for, for the importance of the sex. All the studies that reported a sex difference so weight increase elasticity in females, but no statistical signific uh, significance was funded between sex in the rates of graft rupture. Another study exploring the high reinjuring rate in younger patients performing for the, uh, the group of Key Western, a very, very good group of research from Australia. Uh, the graph of rupture in young people occurred in 18%, the average in the 1.8 years. More of them in the first year and highest graph rupture rates like 30%. But in this study, take care because most of the women performed netball are only 10% of this study performed in soccer players. So when we, when we read the conclusion of the studies, take care because sometimes with the material and methods, it's, it's not clear. And if you study soccer and you've, it's not the same that netball is a sport uh, practice in Australia, no, in, in, our, in our country, for example. This is an interesting, uh, an interesting study performed for uh, the group of Sonnery Cotet from France. A study, the return to play uh, with ACL and anterolateral reinforcement, reconstruction, and finding an, like 80% of return to play in soccer, in soccer players. So the first question, why? Why we need to perform anterolateral reconstruction? Some uh, anatomical reasons, we know the ACL anatomy, but Segon, Paul Segon in the, in the 19s described the anterolateral ligament and performed this fracture, is patognomonic with uh, ACL rupture. In the last years, in the, the group of Vincent from Belgium redescribed this old ligament. It's not a new ligament, it's a very old ligament. And not all the anatomical uh, studies and also not all the uh, um, orthopedic surgeons, I agree if it's a real or not real, uh, an, uh, real uh, ligament. So, but the evidence so the anterior ligament is a distinct ligament in the lateral size. The femoral attach is posterior and proximal to the uh, lateral condyle and the tibial, the tibial it's between the jerdy tubercle and the head of the fibula. 
don't work. Don't work. Okay, now biomechanics evidence. Why? Because until all this performed, this study performed in Cincinnati group from Frank Noyes, anterolateral ligament has a primary restraint to internal rotation, control the rotation of the tibia, so it's important to control the pivot shift. But if sectioning only along the ACL is the most important for the instability. If the study sectioning ACL alone perform more instability than sectioning only the anterolateral. So it's uh, helping to uh, is stability, but not the most important. Recording in progress. Thank you. <laughs> don't work. The past don't work. Yes. See, sí, let's just see. Okay. An another another uh, biomechanic study is uh, from London Group from Amy's. A study also in cadaveric study. And if performed isolate ACL reconstruction, don't control a completely rotational stability. But if performed with anterolateral or lateral extraarticular tinnitus, uh, the control of the rotation is, is perfect. We perform an anatomic uh, study in York University. You can see if we tried the uh, antero anterolateral. You can see is rotated uh, lateral, and if we perform like a lateral extraarticular tenodesis, imagine we are now relaxing. Now put tension and control the anterior lag. Look at this. Only the tension of the anterior lateral tenodesis. And all the reasons are this is meta-analysis performed for a group from uh, Japan. Hong Kong, sorry, uh, better results with anterolateral and uh, ACL reconstruction, best postoperative function, and not more complication. This is one of the why. When? The second uh, question is when? When we perform it? The same group, Sonary Cotet, performed uh, a study with uh, skiers, professional skiers, performing only ACL reconstruction, the rate or rapture like if more or less 30 patients with uh, anterolateral and ACL is like 65%. Uh, but the reconstruction are with hamstrings. This is important for us. This is the same bend analysis I showed you in the past. And this is an algorithm proposed for a group of experts of uh, anterolateral reconstruction. This group of experts uh, published uh, three, four years ago say that if we have one of the major conditions like uh, second fracture, ACL revision, pivot shift degree two or three, or pivoting uh, spores, I make here some question because we don't have uh, agree completely on hyperlax is recommended to perform an anterolateral reconstruction. And also you have too minor, like contralateral ACL rupture, less 25 years old, also is recommended. But the same is performed in air hamstrings. It's not performed with bone patellar bone and anterolateral uh, reconstruction. This is our algo algorithm used in women. If we have a closed feces, we use bone patellar bone anatomic reconstruction with a very good results. And the problem is if you have an anterolateral instability like an hyperlax with a pivot chill explosive, or, or our question is in young people, less uh, 18, 18 years, and also in revision. In these two questions, we recommend anterolateral. For us, this is the question, and we study now in the future is this necessary or not necessary. For us, closed feces, bone patellar bone, in revisions, bone pat uh, uh, or bone patella bone contralateral or allograph, but with an anterolateral tinnitus. And 
hyper lags also, and the problem is in this, in this uh, range of, of years. And the third question is what? We perform anterolateral reconstruction or lateral extraarticular synodesis. What is better? Two interesting uh, studies. One is a PhD uh, study, a thesis performed for one of us uh, fellows. He compared in an anatomic study anterolateral reconstruction with an uh, lateral extraarticular synodesis when with the same biomechanical results, the same, but more complication of the surgery with anterolateral reconstruction, anatomical anterolateral reconstruction. Also the same, this study performance for the, the famous group of La Prat, now is in the top, and the same result, the same result performed also in cadaveric study, same results performed with anterolateral reconstruction and lateral extraarticular tenudesis. And now, uh, the group of La Prat recommend lateral extraarticular tenudesis. He published this technique is more or less like uh, the technique we, we used. This is the technique Dr. Kuga showed us. Uh, we perform a lateral incision between the uh, tubercle of Jerdy, approximately more or less 10 centimeters. Obtain a graph of the lateral fascia with one centimeter to, to 10 centimeters. Pass between to the lateral ligament, you show here, dissected to pass, dissected to pass, and the same, the same check. We fix it, the femur first in the graph, the tibial in the, in the ACL is not fixed in this moment, and we fix it with eye staple. Now, a very interesting study also, Performed is published just um, three three months ago or two two months ago. Compare uh, the fixation with a cortical fixation with a staple and a fixation with a tunnel and a screws. A best results also with a cortical fixation. So, so this is the reason we we prefer, but we can to use also uh, with a tunnel. With a, it's a revision performance for one of the WAF fellows and 51 patients on lateral extraarticular tenodesis and ACL revision performed between this period and 50 patients with result with least uh, score and return to play 19%. For, for us, it's a very safety and very, very good uh, technique to, to recover in, in these uh, major instabilities of the knee. This is an, it's an example, it's at two weeks, when, uh, it's a 15, 15 years uh, with open fish, open physis. We use a semi-T technique with, with a quadruple uh, tendon. Uh, you, we use in the, first start, in, in the first steps some brace to protect, but you can see uh, the patient obtained at two weeks, uh, 90 degrees and full extension. And this, and the other side is a three months post op, another patient, good range of motion and good stability, control stability at three months. So for, for us, take two, take two measures for at home. ACL rupture, more in women. You know, this is the reason this, this meeting. High rates of red rupture and high risk population in soccer. This is a big problem for us. Anatomic reconstruction, ACL, anterolat or lateral articular tenodesis. For us, it's better, but an easy lateral articular tenodesis, but the other technique is, is a correct technique also. In revision ACLs and hyperlax patients, and in the future, in all soccer players, yes or no, and also in jump population, yes or no. It's, a, it's two questions we can to, to answer in the, in the future. And it's important to, to work together like a human castle here in Catalonia to arrive at the final. And also I, I can to congratulate our under 20 selection to win the World Cup in the last, last week. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Pedro. We talk now. Uh, we need to connect online with the, with Rosa.
Hi, Rosa. Congratulations. Hi. First Good morning. Today. Hi, everyone. <laughs> And uh, well, first already... of all, um, sorry. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah please. Uh... Well, I'm Rosa Lopez Diriero, and first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mary and Institute Cugat for the kind invitation. I'm sorry I'm not there. Uh, believe me that I wish I was there. <laughs> and well, I have to talk about a really wide topic, and I'll try to stick to the time. Well, um, open thesis, what should we do? We know that we know that ACL injuries account for more than 50% of the knee injuries in the kids, which is a really high quantity. Uh, girls are in a higher risk. They have two to three times more risk than boys, and they suffer these injuries mainly playing football or basketball and um, doing uh, with a contactless mechanism. And what is the main difference with adults? Well, the feces, which is the growth area of the bones. The distal femoral feces contribute 70% to the total femoral length. So if we damage these feces, we, we're gonna make a growth disturbance. And it also accounts for 37% of the total limb length. So we have to take care uh, and not damage these feces. Um, we have to say that distal femur grows around one centimeter per year and the proximal tibial around 0.7. And these growth plates close around in different times in girls and boys, girls around 14 years and boys around 16 years. Um, it's key to study the anatomical risk factors to improve outcomes and reduce failures. Uh, to choose the best and most appropriate technique. So we have to study if these kids have a recubatum, they have hyperlaxity, a genubalgum, femoral antiversion, a tibial slope greater than four degrees, a uh, decrease in the condyle notch wide, uh, an increased anterior pelvic tilt, or an increased quadricep uh, angle. The diagnosis is basically the same as in adults. We have to do a very good uh, examination. Here I'm doing a Lachman test, Pivot test, and obviously we also have to do an MRI. But the MRI is not the only test that we have to do in these patients. We have to do many complementary tests. The most important one is a left hand x-ray to see the bone age, because in this kind of patients, we don't uh, count, we don't do the techniques depending on the chronological age, but the bone age. We also have to do a teleradiography, like in adults, AP and lateral x-rays, an MRI, and trying to get the physics sequences, and also try to do a Biden score to study the hyperlaxity of these kids. And um, well, the treatment decision making, it's the most difficult part in this kind of patients. Uh, classically, the most common one has been the surgical one, but it has uh, some risks that are the growth plate disturbance uh, that it can lead to a leg length discrepancy that happens between two to 24% of the cases, which is a really high number. The studies are really wide, so there are not a consensus, but if some of the studies show 24% of damage, it's a really high percentage. Sorry. Uh, surgical treatment have shown really good functional and clinical results uh, with a return to sport uh, with 83%, uh, which is a really good uh, result. But nowadays, there are new studies coming that support the idea of uh, conservative treatment, mostly from the Norwegian, Swedish, and well, the northern countries. Uh, we are trying to avoid these surgical complications, but we also have to take into account that there is a higher risk of meniscal and cartilage injuries. And if we delay the surgery, uh, the results are also worse if, if Injury uh, if surgery is indicated. Sorry. So when should we indicate a conservative treatment? Uh, only if there are not coexisting lesions that require surgery. 
for example, meniscal or cartilage injuries, and nor a great instability. Uh, these studies that I've talked about before showed that 50% of these kids uh, that have followed a conservative treatment with a good rehabilitation program achieve good results in adulthood without surgery or meniscal tears, which is a really good result too. The other 50% of these patients will undergo a surgery because of instability, functional limitation, or other injuries that will appear, such as uh, meniscal tears, that account for 30% of these uh, patients who undergo a, a surgery. Uh, we choose a conservative treatment. We have to do a very close follow-up. If kids are not small adults, and um, we have to deal with the kid and with the parents. So we have to try to see them weekly, if possible, and talk a lot. And it's a different relation uh, with the patient. And obviously, we have to indicate a rehabilitation that has to be supervised and at least for six months with a really close co collaboration with the parents, as I said. And usually, we're using a knee brace. But if during this follow-up we see that, uh, or after the rehabilitation, they still have instability, functional limitation, or new injuries, or uh, unacceptable decrease of the sport practice, we should indicate a surgery. And which are the surgical options? Well, it depends on the bone age, as I've said, and obviously, uh, if you're familiar or not with the surgical techniques, because there are many techniques and it's as important not to damage the feces, but also to know really well to do these techniques. So we could do all epiphyseal, which are the ones that doesn't uh, touch the feces, the combined te techniques, doing epiphyseal and transfacial in one of the bones, and transfacial uh, as an adult. And uh, what kind of grafts uh, should we use? The most used one are hamstrings, uh, using a credible uh, graft, as Pedro Alvarez said before. But nowadays, there are studies that show really good results with quad tendon. The, uh, they've seen that 82% of these uh, grafts have a diameter greater than 8 millimeters, which is a really good width. So it's also a good option. We have to try to avoid allografts, which have some really bad results and 38% of failure. It's important to avoid bone plaques. We cannot use uh, TBT uh, in this kind of patients because there is a higher risk of bone breach. We have to take into account that graft diameter decreases with the knee growth. So if we have a really thin graft, it might failure in the future. And also we have to take care and be careful uh, harvesting the hamstrings, because if we touch the periosteum at the ATT, we may damage the, um, the feces and cause a recurbatum. And about the graft fixation, we have to try to avoid screw crossing the feces, obviously. And instead we can use a screws or with washer or claw or staples or steel wraps. And uh, about these techniques, the all epiphyseal ones, we have two types. The physical experience are the most classical one uh, described more than 25 years ago. Uh, it's an intraarticular and extraarticular tenodesis uh, using the iliotibial band. It's a non-anatomical technique, but it has shown to have really good results with a re-rapture rate of 6.6, .6, which is not that bad, and, and really good results, but it's not anatomical. The other types are described by Anderson, it's the most classical one, which has been um, developed and improved in 2015 by the same author, Anderson, which for me is the most reliable, reliable one. And these techniques are, do the tunnels, drill the tunnels 
all in the pieces without touching the feces. And as you can see, the tunnels are horizontal and not anatomical. So there's this bad point that we have to take into account. Combined techniques are used uh, when there's a steel growth um, remaining. And the most common one is the one that is transfacial in the tibia and epiphyseal in the femur because of what I've said before, that uh, the distal femur, femoral feces is the one that uh, accounts for more percentage of uh, growth in the leg. So uh, in case we do a transfacial uh, technique in the tibia, we have to try to do it central to avoid the sides, not to close the growth plate and lead to a, a genuine bottom, or volgum, sorry, and try to use a diameter of the graph between 7 to 11. And if we do a epiphyseal technique in the femur, we either do uh, over the top technique or an horizontal tunnel, as I've said before, but we have to take care because we, we are doing a, an horizontal tunnel and the graft will go under the killing corner. The other type is transfacial in femur that av avoids the killing corner, which is the good point, and epiphyseal in, in tibia with a less ri risk of tibia bulk. The possible consequences of, of delaying the surgery, it's if we indicate a surgery, we have to try to do it before the first six weeks because studies have shown that if we delay the surgery, the meniscal injuries increase for three times. Uh, and if we delayed it more than three months, these injuries increase by four times in, in the meniscal injuries and 11 times times in control injuries. There's a, a meta-analysis from this year, uh, sorry, last year, uh, which has shown to, to the same results, four times in meniscal tears and 3.4 in irreparable meniscal tears if we delayed more than three months. And what are the surgical complications? Well, the most common one and the most well-known is the physical arrest. If we damage this growth plate, we may cause a, a bone breach and it, it's going to lead to a deformity. And depending on the location and the size, we are going to lead to a greater or lesser uh, deformity, which we can correct uh, with a epiphysiodesis in adolescents. The other complication is the boost which is a local hypervascularization. It mainly happens in younger kids and it's gonna lead to a moderate le length discrepancy around one centimeter. In case it's greater than one centimeter, we're talking about one, uh, one and a half, we can also correct it with a percutaneous epiphysiodesis. Antenodesis, which is caused uh, by an excessive graft tension uh, across the feces. It's going to lead to a tenoepiphysiodesis, which is not a bridge, a bone bridge, but it, it also causes a damage in the feces in the feces and a deformity in valgus. So we always have to continue the follow up in this patient clinically and radi radi radiologically, sorry, until growth is complete. This is very important and key to to doing these kind of patients. What about return to sports? Well, uh, the studies have shown that they mainly return to running around 10 months after the surgery. And 80% return to sport to the same sport and 63% return to pivoty or contact sports. Obviously there's a higher risk of re or ACL injury in the other leg if they return to piv uh, pivoty sports, but some patients want to have their, that risk. The return uh, rate is 9%, but I have to say that these studies have just done a two-year follow-up. If we study patients for a longer period, it has been shown that one-third of the patients who undergo an ACL surgery have a new ACL injury, which uh, it's a really high uh, percentage. And this risk is higher in the 
first five years if they return to ball sports or if they have a soon uh, return to sport. My algorithm to choose the surgical technique is if we have a symptomatic patient with a complete ACL tear, we do the x-ray to see the bone age and depending on the bone age, we will choose the technique. In case of uh, boys under 12 bone age, I, I wanna focus on, and girls under 11, we can try a conservative treatment using a brace and a good rehabilitation program. If this doesn't work, uh, we can always do an all epiphyseal technique. In kids uh, with a bone age under 15 for boys and 14 for girls, we can try to do a, a combined technique, partial transfacial technique, or uh, a transfacial technique as in adults, because it has shown to have good results, but you have to take care and, and do the tunnels really central to avoid uh, uh, wider damage in the growth rate. And in kids, or boys uh, over 15 years or girls over 14 years, you can you do a, a normal technique as you would do in an adult. So to sum up, uh, it's key to make a good examination and diagnosis of these patients, searching for non-modifiable risk fac factors. Conservative treatment is a viable and safe option in skeletal immature patients who do, sorry, who don't uh, have uh, an associated injury or major instability problems. If surgical treatment is chosen, it's important to do a good preoperative study, doing the left hand x-ray, um, MRI and everything, and try not, not to delay the surgery more than six weeks. Estimating age bone, uh, bone age, sorry, and remaining growth are key considerations for treatment decision making. Always continue the follow-up until the growth is complete. And no two patients are alike, so always try to individualize the treatment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rosa. Uh, a couple of quick questions in the, in the hall, in the audience. I have a little question to my partners here. Uh, it's just in terms of gender, mm -hmm. uh, when we have uh, a patient with ICL rupture, do you change your mind or your plan if there is a woman or a man just in the terms of gender? Just that, eh? No? No, I, I think that uh, we are talking all the morning between the difference, but uh, just when the ACL is rupture, uh, I think that uh, you you... You look at the knee. Maybe uh, the knee has uh, some details, uh, valgus or patellar, but it depends uh, in, in female than male. Well, in this point, do you uh, search something, something different between when you have a woman or a man? Do you uh, search uh, actively any difference or uh, item to vary this treatment or, or you treat the same? Yes, I mean that uh, you make the same surgery uh, that the knee needs, but not because of the gender. The gender, you know, if if you have a recurvatum, it doesn't matter if it's a male or a male. I don't know your opinion. Uh, it, more or less, in in a closer phases for for us is is absolutely the same, and the question is in open phases. We we don't know if. If it's necessary, uh, lateral reinforcement or no? This is uh, the reason we, we start some study to perform a patriarchal tenodesis to know if the, the re rapture is less with lateral articular tenodesis. Or, but for the other, we close this for, for us is the, the same. same bone patellar bone. In this moment, for us, the, the recommended. But some, some groups now in high risk population like sugars, starting in women uh, to perform systematically uh, lateral articular tenoides like the, the group of uh, NIST. But I, uh, I think in this moment it's not uh, completely clear, it's, in, it's mandatory. Okay, Rosa, uh, do you have the same question? Do you have uh, 
a different plan uh, between girls and boys. Uh, uh, don't think it about the age, uh, the same age or uh, equivalent age. Uh, do you have different plan between boys or girls or other? In an adult, well, we, we, we plan uh, same treatment. I try to focus in the risk factors, as I've said. If they are really hyperlaxed, then I may do a lateral uh, reinforcement, maybe. Uh, but we have to take into account yeah, that if they are really young patients, this lateral reinforcement may cause also a, a, a tenodesis, a tenopifisiodesis, as I've said. We have to be careful. So these techniques, you can use them maybe when they are over 14 or so. Yeah. That the growth is uh, remaining is not that big. Yeah, but yeah, I try to see the risk factors and do uh, an individualized yeah. treatment. I don't treat exactly. all the ACLs the same. We are, all the morning are talking about difference between women and, and men, some risk in women, but at the end, uh, we, we made the, the same. No, what are our plan? What, what is the, the plan? What is the point where we need to change to make a difference? In this moment, we don't have evidence. We have, in this moment, eh, we, have, we don't have evidence to change the uh, surgical treatment. Probably the prevention, probably other factors is the most important, the difference between male and female. This is not our work. Yeah. <laughs> it's the work of the scientifics. Absolutely. Okay, we have no time. Uh, go to the next uh, uh, table. Uh, the rehabilitation and please start your turn. And uh, thank you, thank you, speakers. Thank you, Rosa. We are not doing very well on time, so please be. The first, sorry, the first topic, first stage is Xavier Vidal. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank this Congress for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, ACL injuries in female football players. And also, uh, I, I would like to thank the whole team uh, of Institute Cuat in Barcelona, Medicine nursing, research, communication, and of course, rehabilitation department, because it's a pleasure for me to work with them. Uh, all doctors have explained very well the mechanism, the risk factors, and the prevention with this injury, but I'm a physical therapist, and I want to explain you our experience with this recovery in our center. So when a player has this injury, always present all these factors, impaired proprioception, altered of synesthesia, alteration at the biomechanical level, and bad execution of the exercise. I think that it's very important that we keep in mind all these factors, but also from beginning of the recovery, the neuromuscular and motor control factors, but not only these factors. In my opinion, it's very important that all physical therapies, we keep in our mind the other factors described by authors such as Padua, for example, Tim Hewitt, that is a pleasure because today is here with us online, but she's here. Or Houston or Fleming, because if we consider all these factors, later it's more easier to do the assessment and to do the recovery planning. Some papers talk about that the hormonal factors influence in this injury, and it's true. But in my opinion, it's very important also uh, think the other factors. For example, the mental fatigue, the type of the field, the hours of the sleep, because I think the same that Dr. Kugat, when I talk with him in our, in our center, always he say the same sentence and I think the same. We are facing 
a multifactorial problem produced by several causes that are related to each other. Normally, we work with Melbourne ACL Rehabilitation Guide. This guide talks about six phases, preoperative phase, recovery from injury and preparation for surgery, phase one, recovery from surgery, phase two, strength and neuromuscular control, phase three, running agility and landings, phase four, return to sport, and phase five, prevention of the new injuries. We work with these three phases. If it's possible, it's better that the football player does with us the preparative phase because we can uh, work with her the walking training before surgery. And also, we can work with her to get the full extension and to improve the rank of movement of the flexion because later when, when I want to start the recovery, it's more easy for us. If it's possible before and after, and after surgery, it's better work the flexion in seat position and not in pronounced position because the knee suffer more. So, knowing all these factors, it's very important for us to know exactly the type of the surgery and the history injury with each soccer player because it's not the same if the football player has the ACL injury alone or it's associated with the other injury, for example, the meniscus. There are the five important aspects for us when we want to do the assessment. For example, we do the measure muscle girth, the mobility ankle, for example, with knee to wall test. It's important work uh, the ankle dorsiflexion for prevention, the tendinopathy on the rotulian tendon. Mobility knee with patella test. Mobility hip is very important for us also. Now, if the iliac is in anterior position or in posterior position, because maybe can influence when the football player start walking. And mobility back is important also if the football player has a good mobility in her back or a little business. Immediate post-surgical, the objectives are reduce pain, reduce interarticular fluid, maintain patella mobility, maintenance of muscle tone of the lower limbs, surgical bone healing and immobilizing spilling control. When I start the phase one recovery from surgery, the patient will remain immobilized with plaster spleen, no weight bearing walking with two crutches. Control pain and junk diffusion is the most important and home exercise are recommended. Ankle pumps, quad isometrics, and stike leg raises to start activation muscles. And also in this phase, more or less after 10 days, we remove the stitches. And the main goals uh, are controlled that there is no joint effusion, good patella mobility, and the full extension is very, very important. And every day progress with a flexion, but slowly and with keep caution. In this phase, also, we can do passive manual mobilization, mobilization, uh, mobilization from 0 to 19 degrees, uh, walk, uh, walking with partial load, lower leg elevation with knee extension, and we can start with Indiva therapy, uh, Tecar therapy, wing back therapy is the same, but I prefer uh, when remove the stitches. If the football player needs, we can work also with electrostimulation in quadriceps, and usually we, we finish with Normatec for improve the circulation and, and control the edema, and then wins with game ready for less the swelling. If everything goes well, we can improve the work with lesional strength, with uh, complementary strength, and with neuromuscular control. You can see, for example, this video with this, this uh, football player uh, that uh, uh, she walked in uh, strength of hamstrings uh, with Ur machine, but always with a little resistance. And also we can work with blood flow restriction for improve the hypertrophy in quadriceps. Later, my partner, Ruben Cavani, just explained uh, perfectly the, the work with blood flow restriction. And, and also it's important work the short foot exercise or Janda exercise because uh, for improve the strength in, uh, in intrinsic muscles because this exercise will help the football player when, uh, for improve the reception when, uh, when she start the jumping. And also in, this, in the second phase, uh, we can work with or without a complex and with or without elastic band or football. Normally, we introduce the cardiovascular with bike in week uh, four or five, but depends. And also, we can work uh, with Kaiser machine. Th this exercise, normally, we use only for uh, improve the rank of movement because you use a little, little resistance. And this exercise, we use for introduce the, the stango in her hamstrings. 
if everything is okay, we can improve with complementary work with elastic band for uh, improve the strength in gluteus, calf, or the typical bridge exercise with or without weight. And also it's very important work with core exercise for improve the neuromuscular control and the stability. And also finally with Normatec and with game ready for control edema and less the uh, swelling. This work we, uh, we do until uh, week eight, but the most important is to adapt every recovery to each football player. Uh, it's true that this, this phase is very hard for the football player, but in my opinion, it's very important that all physical therapists to find the motivation because later it's more easy work with the football player. And finally, uh, I, I would like to thank uh, Lucia Gomez, a player of Villarreal Football Club in Spain. Thank you so much for your collaboration with me in this presentation, and thank you all for your attention. Next speaker, Ruben Cabanillas, with the topic re Return to Training. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Ruben Cabanillas. I'm a part of medical staff of Real Club Deportivo Español de Barcelona. It's important thing. In the next 10 minutes, yes, it, it's, it's important, not Español de Cornella, Español de Barcelona. <laughs> In the next 10, 10 minutes, I try to explain a little bit my way or my approach to, to return to training an ACL injury. First of all, it's very important to have a good first stage, first acute phase. My colleague have explained very well all the steps, all the situations and all the process of the first stage. If it's not doing well, probably all I want to exp uh, explain now don't have sense or is unuseless. I explain a perfect situation of ACL rehab. Normally it's not a perfect situation, but I try to explain a perfect situation. My six pillars of return to training, one, blood flow restriction training, second one, strength training, then neuroplastic, neuroplasticity is important to train the brain, not only the, 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 the knee, the structure, the brain is important, return to, to running, jump again, and decelerate again. I explain three of these, not all, but I want to keep in, in mind the, the others, because I don't have a lot of time. First one, blood flow restriction. The preoccupation of physios, of doctors, of a lot of clinics is the, the quadriceps muscle loss in the first stage. We know with blood flow restriction, we can avoid this, we can potentiate the muscle, the muscle gains and this hypertrophy in first stage. But in my case, I explain the, the load phase. I do two moments in my, in my load phase. The first stage, I'm focused in the injury leg, okay? Then I'm focused in both legs. In the first stage, my goal is muscle hypertrophy, generate a good tension in around these muscles and protect the structure. Then when I use with both legs, my goal is muscle activation and have a good feeling before the strength training. My approach, normally, first part of the session, block 30, 15, 15, 15 repetition to fatigue, a lot of fatigue in every block, it's important. Then I use blood flow restriction with aerobic uh, approach by bike, normally, or in a treadmill, but normally in a bike, 10, 15 minutes. This is my approach in the first, in the first moment. Then only at the first part of the session in exercise like squat, lunge, leg press, I don't know the, the exercise exactly, it depends the patient, but for muscle activation, for recruitment, a lot of muscle fibers, okay? This is, this is, a, this is a, a progression of the loads. 
So let us see. Okay, this is the first stage. Important: isolate the muscle, generate fatigue, and the situation for the patient is uncomfortable. They need they need to feel bad sensation of the body. It's suffer a lot. Then, same 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 way, but we can uh, we can do with uh, heavy load, 10, 40 percent of repetition maximum, and finally, again more heavy load with uh, both legs. It's important. The key message in this in this first part, isolate muscles, generate fatigue, and generate a good a good uh, experience for the patient for the next uh, for the future of this technique. We continue. For me, the most important in the whole process, probably we did uh, strength training in prehabilitation. We did a strength training in acute phase. We do strength training in return to training phase, in load phase, and we do a strength training in all of the life of this patient. This is a way to see uh, strength training. I think it's complicated, a lot of names, but it's based in overcoming tasks and progressive load of the structure. In first moment, my goal is protect the knee, protect the structure. I can load the knee um, through the hip, through the hamstrings, through the calves, and not a lot of load uh, ex uh, directly to the knee with uh, knee flexion, for example. And finally, my principal goal is expose the, the athlete uh, a some situation with perturbation, unexpected uh, ambient, with a little bit of chaos, but I need to educate the person for doing this. Okay, now we can see some progressions in return to running and return to decelerate to make more sense the all things I I say now. Lot of videos, lot of image. You can have an, an idea of of the of the stimulus during the process and this is return to running moment very important for the for the outlet for me no 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 important but for the outlet it marks an before and after i don't know the reason probably because there, there are a lot of bullshit around return to to running but for the outlet is important for the outlet is important for me is important for her mental disorder probably we can see a progression. It's important in a lot of programs. I saw squats, bridge, uh, deadlift, exercise like this, and then run. No, it's it's crazy do, doing this. It's important to progress all the progress with overcoming task, force production task, ground reaction force task. It's important and graph healing, of course. But we can see examples on the gym and on the field. This is during the process of two, three months until five months. All of this is the progress. I can run if I'm doing only squats. I need to do this. In the, in the part in my, my right, I, I show you my way of assess if the if the athlete is prepared to, to run. In this case, with force platforms, some exercise on field, a skipping exercise, and I see if the wrong reaction force, the force production are similar in one leg and the other. If I start run with some um, bad biomechanic, probably we have problems in the future. Finally, return to decelerate. It's not a trend like return to running, but for me, it's very, very important decelerate again. In some situations in soccer field, continuously accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. In all the tasks happen this. We can see with GPS, we move, for example. This is my way to uh, assess the deceleration on the gym 
with four plates, I, th I know it's not the best way to, to do, but it's my way and for me it's useful. I know these four plates don't have a triaxial mode, only an axial, but I know the force production in a, direc in a direction and I know how many force produce um, um, with her body weight, 2.5, 3, 4, I know this. It's important to decelerate again. Here, same than when return to running, we can see some progressions of exercise on the gym and exercise on the field. Same, three months until six, seven months in this process of this outlet. It's important to progress, progressive load, overcoming task, generate the flow of is necessary in the process. And I think this is one of the way to rehab, to return to training the outlet to the team. You can see the, the videos. Thanks for listening to me and I hope you enjoyed this time. Thank you. Next speaker, Azara Ford, with a topic from medical discharge to return to competition. Good morning, first of all, thanks to uh, Cubat Institute um, for giving me this opportunity. I will try my best in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's a lot and a very brief time. In summary, um, the main objectives of return to competition, classically, is to prevent ACR injury by reducing modifiable risk factors and improving health. And the second objective, sometimes forgotten, is to prepare the outlet uh, to compete at the highest performance in a hyper-complex environment. It's important to remember that football, the movement patterns are changing con constantly. To successfully implement the return to competition um, process, is it essential to understand injury etiology? So, uh, players uh, repeat high risk situations without sustaining injuries. However, when certain conditions are met, including injury mechanism, as we can see here in, in football, um, and some risk factors, the same situations can result in an ACL uh, injury. Here, uh, we can see in soccer, maybe uh, a change in, of direction in defensive action are the most important, and this is very important to, to take in account when you planify your strategies to return to competition. Um, and it's very important uh, to take in mind that this happens in deceleration actions with biomechanical characteristics of trunk, knee, and, and foot. Also very important to take in account the modifiable uh, neuromuscular and biomechanical risk factors that we know the, that they are modifiable by, by training. Here uh, we can see the relationship between ACL risk patterns, uh, in this case uh, dynamic nivalgus, and associated neuromuscular and biomechanical injury risk factors well reported by the uh, literature. Uh, here we have uh, Tim Hewitt, one of the uh, opponents of this uh, conference, but I think uh, we have a lot of literature about that. I'm not going to repeat it. So here, um, following um, a flexible and specific um, return to competition framework is presented uh, with an emphasis on the return to training and return to competition levels, especially in the conditional and coordinative areas. This framework proposes an integrated return to competition approach that combines the work of skills, focusing first on fundamental movement skills and after that football specific skills with physical capabilities, uh, starting first on functional mobility, dynamic stability and strength, and progress to high intensity actions that focus on power, uh, stress shorter cycles, uh, speed, agility, and resistance to high intensity and intermittent efforts. In addition, it also integrates, and also very important, cognitive, perceptual, emotional, and creative structures typical from team sports. 
Of course, the response to sport process following ACR reconstruction is a continuum without strict phases. Despite did this, and to better understand this flexible framework, we propose different uh, levels of approach to competition or different levels of progressions, rehabilitation, return to training, and return to competition. Initially, the rehabilitation level of approach uh, main objectives are biological healing and improvement and maintenance of the adult's physical conditioning. I'll be brief with this phase, just to emphasize that the work of mobility, strength, and neuromuscle control will be the keys during the later phases. Especially, very, very important, the triple flexion exercise uh, with uh, the lower limb and also with a good mechanics. This is basics in the first stages and uh, also in, in the other uh, phases. So when we have uh, uh, pain and enema control, acceptable knee of, of motion, especially extension, good neuromuscle control during active daily living. So let's start to return to training. The main objective uh, of these phases is to prepare the outlet to tolerate group training with confidence while minimizing the risk of re-injury. First, returning to fundamental movement skills, such my colleague has said, to decelerate, running, change of direction. After that, to return to uh, soccer, uh, sorry, football specific skills in a stable environment. And after that, to return to specific uh, skills in a complex environment, typical from team sports. So in the return to training activity level of progressions, on a physical level and generally, this phase focuses on improving basic motor skills through both functional strength and low impact neuromuscle control training. During this phase, the creation of a structure, uh, muscle, tendons, cartilage, tendons, with uh, fundamental strength exercise is uh, very, becomes especially important. And don't forget compensatory exercise, specific ACL neuromuscle risk factors. And always uh, the key is the quality of movement. The second objective of this phase is to regain neuromuscle control during fundamental movement skills, uh, focusing in lower limb dynamic stability and starting displacements from running to change of direction. The third one to start football specific skills in a stable environment. Here we have some examples. And the fourth is to improve low impact resistance to fatigue, progressing for, from low impact to high impact skills. And remember that football is a sport where predominates high intensity intermittent training. Here we present some useful traits that can help to monitor and control the progress to return to sport phase. Neuromuscle control during fundamental movement skills, core stability, ratio between uh, hamstring and quadriceps, and also uh, the monitor and the control of interlimb asymmetry. In this case, it's very important to control the magnitude and the movement strategy of different uh, skills, fundamentals. Let's start to return to sport. The first specific objective is to improve um, strength, uh, direct, sport directed strength uh, development or a specific strength. We can progress in two ways with traditional low overload or with coordinative overload. Here we can see some examples um, where we are uh, using flywheel devices. This type of equipment has very advantages. Why? Because we can create um, ex um, eccentric overload and we can reproduce, we can see here, the injury mechanisms. Remember that uh, normally are in the selected actions, defensive actions. Here we can introduce some perturbation, some little cognitive load, and we are progressing 
to the real world, to the real uh, football competition. Progressively, in creating this eccentric over overload, typical from the injury mechanism. The second objective here is to develop fundamental movement skills, but at high intensity. Okay, we run, we can change our direction, but we have to make this at high speed. First, in a stable environment, and progressively, we have to introduce unexpected actions and fatigue conditions, the real world. The third objective is to improve resistance to fatigue in a sport specific environment. Here we have some tasks, we can start with a uh, novel position and we can introduce simulated opposition. And at last, combining sport specific, soccer specific skills, progress, uh, progress towards a variable and unexpected environment. Sometimes all these uh, introduction or progressions are forgotten. So now let's go start to the last level of the process, return to competition. Are we phys physically and mentally prepared, ready to competition? Here we present, well, we know that there is no a consensus of a battery of tests to return to competition, but here are some examples that we, we used, as, as, such as the tag jump test, the CMAS, or one leg for distance. There are a lot of battery of tests. Here's just some examples. Okay, to su su I, sorry, uh, the main objectives of this phase is to prepare the outlet, the outlet not only for competitions, also to competition and maximum performance. Also, there is, sorry, the success of return to sport is predicated on the athlete's ability to return at above uh, the pre-injury level of competition without fear of re-injury influencing their performance. A specific objectives to achieve this level are, are change to compete and win, tolerate chronic load. Remember, no, Tim Gabbett says that we have to spa to um, avoid uh, spikes, um, very typical from the return to, to train and return to competition. Continue to control ACL injury modifiable risk factors. And while an athlete may compete and even tolera tolerate most of the training sessions with their teammates at pre-injury levelers, this does not guarantee that they have achieved their maximal potential. And here we have to continue to training to the return to competition at maximal performance. We have to improve resistance to different specific conditions, refine sport specific skills symmetrically in a hyper complex environment, train competitively. This is very important for the, for the outlet, for the player. And to end this presentation, the home message Return to sport uh, training program must be personalized and based on hyper complexity of football. It's important to others and evaluate modifiable risk factors on an ongoing basis. Ensure good neuromuscle control in situations with high risk of ACL injury. Progress in the specificity, specificity of the task. Remember that for, uh, sport teams uh, are uh, a chaos integrated perceptual and cognitive structures in our exercises and respect the two parts of the, of the process. Each player needs her time or his time and the coordinated effort of the medical and technical staff. Sometimes the technical staff is forgotten. It's also very, very important. The medical, of course, and the technical, of course, the coach, the strength and conditioning um, coach, I think, are also very, very important, especially in these uh, last phases. And thanks for your attention. And if somebody wants uh, to ask a question, uh, it will be a pleasure to, to answer. Next speaker, Mayol Martí, with the topic rate of return to play in mutualidad futbolista. 
Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, mostly an Institute Cugat and uh, MIDI. Um, I'm here to uh, talk about the rate of ACL injuries in Mutualidad Futbolistas. Uh, my name is Mayol Martí. As uh, Esther said, I'm a physiotherapist uh, working in the Mutualidad of Futbolistas. Mutualidad of Futbolistas is a healthcare institution that uh, is under the Soccer Federation in Spain. So mostly here, uh, I want to show you uh, the data uh, of a retrospective study that we made with uh, ACL reconstructions. Uh, and well, the purpose was analyze the outcome of ACL reconstructions in Mutualidad de Futbolistas. Uh, we got a sample of 558 soccer players with ACL reconstructions between the years 2015 to 2018, uh, who answer a questionnaire about uh, their injury, the treatments that they received, the return if they return to soccer, and also if they uh, made before and now they do uh, injury prevention. So every each uh, player was asked at least two years uh, post surgery. Um, so the the that is the sample and was uh, mostly uh, male, uh, male uh, 390, and in female was 160, 168 uh, uh, soccer players. Uh, I am going to focus in that uh, part of the sample. So we got a female pro ACL profile that uh, in average is an age of uh, 21.3 years old, who plays mostly soccer 11, uh, also soccer seven or futsal, but mostly soccer 11, and uh, got mm, well, mostly uh, in that 55% uh, the right knee was the, the ACL uh, knee, that, uh, the ACL injury knee. Um, as uh, a lot of uh, the colleagues here uh, were talking about the injury mechanism was by no contact in the 74% of the cases in our data and was mostly in uh, making a change of direction. Um, the ACL graph was a patella tendon in 74% of the cases and they related or they narrate a family ACL history uh, in the 31% of the cases, and in that uh, group, uh, the father of, uh, in that case, the, the, the girl or the woman, uh, was who got that injury. The recovery process, uh, we have here several, well, my colleagues uh, were explaining it about the, the several phases, but, um, well, there is the ACL injury, the diagnosis, the medical treatment, uh, which is uh, during the whole process, but also there is the rehabilitation and the return to training is that uh, what we call readaptation. And at the end is the, uh, there is the return to play. Uh, the average time of the total recovery was 8.9 months. So um, looking all of the data and the profiles that we got, uh, we have to, to reunificate the process. We are in a healthcare institution that, uh, um, well, um, we have uh, several centers uh, shared around uh, all the territory here in Catalonia, and uh, we have uh, different uh, rehabilitation centers who made all of this, uh, well, most of the phases. Um, so. Well, I told that because um, not everybody uh, is doing uh, at the sample is doing that phase of uh, readaptation. Uh, mostly uh, was um, well, 80% that uh, made it, but that 20% they didn't do it, and uh, we were wondering about if they return to play. And mostly they say no, uh, 70%, and yes, in 31% who made it uh, come back in the 73% uh, of the cases. So that is a significant uh, part uh, that uh, this phase has to be done to, to come back and it's, uh, it's a significant. So um, at the same time, uh, at this phase, who, who was in charge of this phase? Uh, as I said, uh, there are many centers who are uh, doing the recovery. Um, so the mostly the professionals who made that phase were the team, 
uh, the team staff, uh, the, or the coach, or the fitness coach, or the physiotherapist, that is the 32.3%, but some one of them, some one of the patients made it alone. Um, so they uh, did come back, um, and mostly was the 61% of them, but who made it with the team, uh, they came back uh, at, uh, well, uh, that uh, almost uh, 90%. So we have to reunificate. We have to to um, to maybe try to to well, yeah, uh, make the same things, no, in all, all of the territory here. But uh, at the same time, or uh, or maybe we we have to filter the, the the recovery process. No, we have to know if that mm, process is well done. Uh, why I say that? Because at the moment of the medical discharge, we were asking to them uh, how, how was the perception uh, of uh, how, how, how much, um, how, how recovered I was no, in that moment. So they said in a percentage at 75.6%, uh, I felt recovered. Um, and the next question was, what did you have to work on in that moment? What did you need to, to work? So they say mostly in strength and also in confidence. Um, as uh, one colleague here, uh, Elena, uh, was talking about the, the confidence. Uh, so strength, uh, the literature said that for the return to play decision, it's necessary to perform a strength assessment. And the limb symmetry, limb symmetry index is some uh, index that uh, we can uh, take as a reference, no? Uh, and uh, the injury leg, it's uh, recommend, well, it uh, could be satisfactory to be uh, the strength um, next to or, or more than 90% uh, according to the other leg, the, the not injury leg. But in a sport like uh, soccer has to be or is recommended to be 100 or more than 100 uh, percent. So for the confidence is related with the psychology. Confidence is one of the barriers to progress and uh, to return to, to soccer, as is the fear. That is the most commonly reported in the literature, the frustration, anxiety, and uh, psychological readiness and motivation. Uh, but there are, during the process, some uh, um, common uh, size, uh, f um, psychosocial interventions that we can do. Uh, we can educate, uh, we can trade the, uh, well, we can mark the trade, uh, treatment goals. Um, the patient can do, uh, or we can help to them to do a visualization. They can have uh, self-talks, graduate exposition, giving social support, and making relaxation. Um, so there are many uh, psychological assessments that we can do, but mostly for the return to play decision, we are using the a ACL RSI. Uh, how many players uh, return to soccer? So they came back in our sample, um, almost uh, that 65% uh, of them. And they came back mostly in 66% at the same category. So why not? What the, the people who didn't come back, uh, why they didn't come back? They re, they narrate about fear, no, uh, cause the fear, or uh, for a medical recommendation, or maybe because they got another ACL re injury and, and they didn't come. So, how are you nowadays? That was another question. Uh, well, nowadays at the moment that we were doing the the, the questionnaire, and the perception of recovery after at least two years was that I am now at almost this uh, 85%, uh, feeling recovered 85%. So did you ever feel 100% recovered? We, we were asking uh, also, and they say no, 60% of them, and yes, 40%. So how much time that in that part of the, of the sample that they say yes? How much time did you need to feel 100%? And they say in average that uh, 14 months. Uh, remember that the medical discharge uh, in our sample was at uh, 8.4 months and they needed five months, almost six months more to feel 100%. So we have to prevent injuries, primary and secondary. Um, I say that because the previous injuries in our sample 
was mostly they didn't have uh, in almost 30 percent but they narrate some acl injury before in the same knee or in the contralateral knee that it's uh, the 17 percent uh, an acl injuries and after the recovery of the the acl that we were asking for uh, they say no i didn't have more injuries in almost this 40 percent that includes the retired and the active players and also the re-injury rate was in the same knee that 14 percent and uh, to the other leg uh, to the other knee that almost 40 percent too so the prevention reality we were asking to them about the prevention and uh, the question was do you think that uh, could be interesting to perform injury prevention programs and they say yes um, 100 percent that is something good that, that they have interest to to do prevention but uh, the next question was uh, did you perform it before your injury and they say no we didn't uh, 75 percent <laughs> and yes this 60 uh, 26 percent so and now uh, after the injury do you do you perform uh, prevention nowadays and they say uh, well it was next next to uh, or near to that 50 50 but no we don't in that uh, 52 percent and uh, that uh, 46 percent they say yes the rest because it's not 50 50 exactly they didn't answer so not everybody is doing prevention however who are doing it we, we don't know exactly what they do um because we were asking who is who was in charge or, or who is in charge now in your uh, prevention uh, or in your team prevention no who is in charge of your team prevention that was the question so mostly the team staff no the coach or the fitness coach mostly or the physiotherapist but they just the 2.1 percent they knew that they were doing the fifa 11 plus uh, program as one of the programs that uh, in the that is one of the problems that in the literature uh, is no that can reduce uh, the the injuries and mostly in knees it's uh, close that uh, the knees injuries can be reduced using that program in 48 uh, percent so in conclusion um in our case, in our data, uh, according to our data, we have to reunificate. We have to, to, to work on the reunification of the recovery process. We always we can improve, but uh, it's needed to make an assessment before to return to play, according to the, the player's opinion, because they were asking about the, the we, I needed to work more in strength and also in psychology, uh, like a confidence as well as the neuromuscular control and uh, so some more stuff no like uh, um, uh, more risk factors but they were asking for that for the prevention we got a compliance um, of them uh, they they had an interest for it but uh, how uh, how could we keep uh, that interest for a long time uh, we sometimes no it happens uh, that is some player that uh, get injury and then okay yeah yeah we we are worried we have to do prevention but how we keep it on a long time so um, maybe giving awareness uh, giving an examples of other play ACL players experience um, and also empower them empower them uh, maybe they we are worried uh, giving some programs giving uh, uh, well uh, taking care of the prevent of the recovery but maybe also they have to think about or ask themselves how can i improve in soccer and 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 give the we have to give the the tools for it and but they have to be the main protagonist the main character here and we must guide them uh, to give him as i said the, the proper tools to treat and to prevent injuries so thank you everybody for uh, your time um, and my presentation is done so if uh, you have any questions i will be glad to ask if anyone have a question please Uh, congratulations for all the presentation, incredible. So it's for all the panel. 
is the same question that Dr. Say has uh, as, as uh, the surgeons. Uh, do you change your protocols in the first phase and recovering and return to play uh, for the gender? Is different in males and females? Do you change it or no? It's for all, for all of you. <laughs> okay, uh, at, that, at that moment I work with females, okay, but uh, 10 years ago I, I worked with um, the national uh, ski selection and I work with men and with female. And it's, it's different uh, because it's uh, men <laughs> in a neuromuscle control view are easier. So they, are, they have less deficits. So, uh, you know, you, I always explain that, you know, uh, when I prepare a, uh, a training for, for men, I can, you know, put a lot of series, a lot of uh, kilos, a lot of jumps. But when I have a woman, I have I work with women. Uh, maybe I was thinking to make I don't know 15 jumps or 50 jumps, and at last I only can make 10. Why? Because the, you, we are always looking to neuromuscle deficits, biomechanical. So uh, female uh, have more fatigue. So uh, you have to control more the load, the, the joint load. So for me. It's different, but you don't look at a woman or at a man. You just look to um, the person. So um, sometimes you have a man that has a lot of dynamic valves, and you have to start in point zero. And sometimes you have a girl, and you start at point five. Uh, I don't know if you understand me. Uh, sometimes you can start to jump with a female, and with a boy, you have to to start to make a, a static uh, balance. Uh, I don't know if you have. <laughs> Do you have? Uh, <laughs> Well, in my opinion, is of course it's different because the risk factor is different in, in female and male. But in my opinion, my speciality is the first uh, stage, and in my opinion, the most important is to adapt the recovery. It depends if the female or, or male, but to adapt the recovery to, to sport player. Okay, in in my opinion, currently I work with top female athletes and. I think it's similar than a top uh, boy, boy soccer player. And in this case, in my case, more of the of the process in the in the ACL injury, I work together with boys and ladies, and no problem. I think the the most difference is in in youth athletes because uh, boys have more experience or have another conditions to to produce force than ladies, but in in top in top athletes than my case, uh, the difference is not not all not 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 uh, not uh, difference. Sorry. Yeah, I'm agree with my colleagues. Uh, we we have to to look to the person that we have in front, and we have to adapt to them to to him or her or. So, yeah, according to the literature, we know the, 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 exter the internal risk factors, but at the same time, we have to manage the, the person, uh, the, the person. We have to guide the person. So um, they have uh, also different kind of personalities and depend how, how he or she come to the consult, you know, to, to, to the gym or, or to the facility. We have to adapt the session every time. So, and uh, another question: what, what do you think about the um, virtual reality in the neuro training uh, process? Um, do you think it's important? Do you think it's the future? Do you think it's the present? Uh, uh, I have seen the Cincinnati Children's uh, Hospital Laboratory Lab. I think, in my point of view. Uh, this is from science and maybe <laughs> for uh, to big hospitals, but the people that we work in the gym and every day, uh, the cost of this equipment is too much. Uh, we need more, more, <laughs> more physios, more strength and conditioning coaches that uh, stay in the base with uh, young athletes 
and I think maybe in <laughs> 50 years we had virtual uh, training. I think it's it's a compliment, but uh, you have to start for the base. You have to make a good launch, a good run, a good change of direction, and after that, okay, virtual. Uh, who do you say virtual? Davis, yes, Davis. No, no. The, I mean the. the we don't have to forget the, to do the, the basic steps. So Maybe in the Cincinnati lab okay. with Greg Meyer and Tim Hewitt, it's okay, but we are in, in Catalonia, we are <laughs> far away for, from that. Um, when, I, when I finished my studies, I, I was, I, was working a lot of years in in neurology specialty, and now I have uh, I'm working a lot of years now with the sport specialty, and, and in my opinion, uh, it's important work the neuromuscular control and the, the brain uh, training, because uh, for me uh, after after uh, this injury, uh, is is very very important. If you remember the first diapositive that I put here, uh, it's very important work all these factors. In in my case, I I saw some some uh, VR uh, Google's, and I think it's a useful device. But currently, it's not prepared to to the necessities of physios. It's too far to the uh, physios needs in in this uh, in this approach. But in my in my in, in my opinion. Or in my experience, I use some Googles, but it's stroboscopic Googles than uh, close one eye, the two eyes in different times, and this this is this is uh, a good a good way to to maintain the concentration during the task or during the, the field training because you know not, never what happened in the next step, and I think it's useful in the future, but it's useful in the in the present. have a question all the panel please uh, what do you think to use a bracing or some bandage or taping in the rehabilitation or adaptation do you use that no when I had a, a case uh, for US USA a, a female soccer soccer player and the doctor of the team uh, uh, say me is a must to uh, to wear the, the brace during all the process and during the first games on, on on her own team. For me, I think it's not necessary in most of cases, but if the medical staff uh, wants to wear the bracing, I respect. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it depends on, on the brace and it depends on the, if it's necessary for the stability of the joint. No, we know in ankle, in ankles, no. we know that yeah. uh, if you if you have an instability, you have to make a tape. In knee injuries, if you have a posterior cruciate ligament, uh, we have one this year with uh, Monse is here now, and of course in the first stages we need the brace. But the the idea is to um, uh, say goodbye to the brace. Uh, if the the players needs because he he has fear so oh, and he needs uh, she needs confidence okay but the idea is to you, know, you have to improve your neuromuscle control if everything is okay without uh, Brace. protective uh, braces <laughs> thank you Thank you. Um, this is a question for Ruben. Um, since you talked about the um, return to run, my question is, well, it's two questions. The first one is, um, how do you think about introducing a pliometric um, treatment before running, since maybe running can be seen as a, as a, pro as a, a series of small uh, jumps. So how do you think about or do you introduce the jump training before uh, running, at the time of running, or you uh, wait until uh, the patient is running already? 
in in my case uh, normally i i do both at the same at the same time you tell perfectly run is a consecutive of jumps small jumps and if the person can run the person can can jump with some considerations probably they can jump 40 centimeters and landing to the surface but they can doing uh, a small a small jumps different kind of plyometric training this is my way oh thank you and the second question is about the broad floor restriction treatment you apply um i was wondering that you applied the uh, maximum repetition as a measure for how much load the patient can uh, can can train how do you measure the maximum repetition in cases for example in the club in the soccer club you have maybe pre-injury values or but in cases of 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 uh, people that you don't have this uh, precision screening maybe how do you measure that it's it's difficult because in this situation the the athlete is is injured and we don't know exactly how many kilos can move and i i use a rpe scale i ask constantly what do you feel you feel you feel fatigue on your muscles if not feel fatigue i can put a little bit of of load if the fatigue is correct i continue with this with this load but normally i use very low load i can put more repetitions or more pressure in the blood flow restriction until 80% Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for the great presentations and, of course, for being on time. Uh, now we face a different moment of the course, which will be roundtables. First, we will have one with experts, in which we will have a first talk and then some discussion with experts and then a, a, a roundtable with the actual players who are the, pro the real protagonists, protagonists of this. And we could not be more proud to have today with us uh, Tim Hewitt, one of the big names uh, in the research and all these fields for many years with uh, a lot of publications that we follow. Uh, Tim, you have been mentioned and cited many times uh, today. And thanks so much for your contributions and for your impressive research metrics for being here at 6 a.m. in Minneapolis time. So thanks so much. Please, Tim. talk today about my program I call the 5P, Personalized Preventive Predictive Performance Program. These are my two students, Carmen and Katie, and as you can see, they, they were in our early prospective cohort studies. They ruptured their ACLs, and 13 years later, they're having cartilage resurfacing procedures. The, the problem is with women, Carmen and Katie are actually the rule rather than the, than the exception here. So we use this approach we call preventive biomechanics. And one of the areas we look at is ACL injury, cartilage injury. And we use focused populations, underserved populations like females. And we get the entire medical system involved in the process so that every single patient is a research subject. Again, our focus is underserved populations. We use large cohorts. We do prospective multi-institutional randomized controlled trials, and we have multiple university partners. So this is a problem. This is Rebecca Lobo rupturing her ACL. As you can see, there was a perturbation up high, which led to movement of her trunk lateral to her hip and knee, which leads to a ground reaction force and a moment that collapses her hip and knee in. And Rebecca 
was the best player in the WNBA at that time and never really recovered. So what is the problem? What are the long-term health consequences? Recent study in NFL players, not so surprising, they had a two-fold increase in arthritis. More surprising, they had a 50% increase in risk of myocardial infarction. So what we think this leads to is an overall inflammatory systemic process throughout the body. So if we're going to try to prevent these from occurring, we need to think about mechanisms. We need to think about screening and risk stratification and then targeted training with effective neuromuscular interventions. So if we examine the mechanism, the body habitus overall, you get this as I just showed you, this lower extremity valgus with hip adduction and distal tibial abduction relatively low knee flexion when the injury occurs, single leg on a flat rotated foot, center mass away from the foot base. And then if you zoom in to the knee itself, what you get is if this is my fibula, you get this combination of distal tibial abduction, anterior translation, especially of the lateral compartment, and in coupled interior rotation, if they happen very rapidly, rupture of the ACL. So, Tim, excuse me, would you mind to maximize your PowerPoint presentation? Like to start the, the presentation because we not see the slides running. So you don't see my slides? You, yeah, you have to start presentation, uh, not like to start the presentation on the bottom right side of the PowerPoint, last version, I guess. F5, oh, they, they tell me if you press F5 would work as well. F5. Uh, so that we see the slides running because we just see the title, the first slide, but nothing else so far. Okay. Control. Are you seeing it now? No changes, right? Yeah, you click. Click, click on, on uh, now we have seen a different slide. Is that, is not, is that working now? It's, it's just to start the presentation. There is a, the icon when you, uh, yeah, on, yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's see. You it now? They say that you are uh, sharing another screen, maybe. Is it possible uh, that you are sharing another screen, maybe? Um, or unshare and share again, maybe, they say to me. Okay, Sorry. stop share. And then I'll share screen We again. see you, but we don't see the presentation. Uh, this is the present share. And now, now if I, are you seeing this a different one now? We see uh, the preventive biomechanics 5P that you mentioned at the beginning. So but all you see, all you see is the first slide. Now is the second one, but we see <laughs> the, we don't see the presentation screen. It's just the PowerPoint when you open that you have all the options, file, home, insert, draw, all these things, but we don't see the, the actual presentation. Do you see the presentation here? Send me in the chat. I think you can share. Uh, they say if you can send the PowerPoint file into the chat of um, Zoom and uh, yeah, IT guys it's, will... It's We'll run the yeah, it's too, it's too large. Um, the, can you see it now? Yes, but we don't see the, what is the presentation. We see the, the, the PowerPoint software. Yeah, and, but you can see me move the, the you, slides, right? Yeah, we, we can see it with this view. Yeah, that would work. Yeah, if, let's just go through with this one. I'll, I'll try to maximize it. Okay. 
okay, at least we can see the information, but it's just smaller than usually it used to be. Yeah, let's see if I can. If I can get it uh, They say if you can click on slideshow. I think you okay. already did, but. That's, I just clicked on slideshow. Yeah, I, yeah. Didn't work too much, but whatever. Here is too big. Then we have some titles cut. If you can decrease a little bit the zoom. Uh, okay, a little bit less maybe. Okay, yeah, that's a little bit better. And I, you need me to increase the size a little bit more? I think it's okay. It's okay, everyone is agree, agrees. Okay. Thanks so much. No, sure. So we focus on the underserved athlete. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the female athlete. And again, this is uh, Rebecca Lobo rupturing her ACL in the WNBA, one of the best players at that time. Uh, she had multiple injuries and she never quite recovered. Now, we all know that increased risk of arthritis at least been reported anywhere between two and tenfold higher. And, um, and what we didn't realize before this study was that there's actually a 50% increased risk of myocardial infarction compared to those without ACL tears, which speaks to systemic inflammatory processes. So we use this multiple pronged approach, uh, looking at mechanism screening, risk stratification, with the uh, examining the mechanism, this combination of valgus, relatively straight knee, single foot on a, a rotated foot away from the with the foot away from the center of uh, of mass, uh, with the knee and the distal tibial abducted, anterior translation, internal rotation combination. And what we use is multiple converging approaches, and we put all the data together in vivo, in vitro, in silico data to see where the true data points lie. And we use multiple data inputs imaging. This shows a bone bruise, which gives us a clue, a forensic clue into how the injury actually happened. And we can put these cartilage pressure distribution details into our computer and silico models. This shows where the bone bruises, where the focus of the bone bruises is, is which is reproducing the high forces that occurred to create the injury. We, from that, we develop a 3D finite element model. And basically what it shows is knee abduction combined with internal rotation and anterior translation. So each of these separately, anterior shear, abduction, internal rotation, all increase relative strain on the ACL. But when you combine them all together, the load is high enough to actually rupture the ACL. The pivot shift, what the, the surgeon is doing with the pivot shift is basically applying the same exact loads, distal tibial abduction combined with internal rotation and anterior translation forces. And from what then reproducing the motions and the luxations that occurred during that injury forensically. So there's overwhelming evidence that this is actually the mechanism. This distal tibial, ab, distal tibial abduction combined with anterior translation and internal rotation. And this has been done in young cadaveric studies. Uh, if valgus is seen uh, during video and whether this is in vivo or, or in silico or in vitro, the data all combines to show us that this is the actual mechanism. So when we look at uh, athletes actually tearing their ACL, this is Rashawn Rondo rupturing his ACL, this single leg valgus extended knee. So it's leg ligament and quadriceps dominance. I'm gonna talk more about those in a minute. And we've focused more of our work 
on the female athlete. And this is the whole team of athletes where we studied the reliability and reproducibility of our measures across three of our labs at Ohio State, at Cincinnati Children's, and, and at University of Kentucky. And basically what we see is this common problem, this common So This is a extended foot, high ground reaction force, ruptures the ACL. Again, using the quad to stabilize the primarily leads to that extended knee, flat foot, high force. So if you look at the mechanism, what we've done over the last couple decades is we've identified parallel neuromuscular imbalances for that relate directly to those aspects of the injury mechanism I just showed you. This knee abduction problem is connected with ligament dominance, which is use of the ligament to absorb and dissipate force rather than activating the musculature to, to absorb and, and dissipate those forces before the ligament experiences them. Quadriceps dominance, which is use of the quadriceps primarily to stabilize the joint leads to this straight knee low flexion. Single leg, part of the mechanism relates to leg dominance. All athletes are leg dominant. Some are more dominant than others, especially when they're stabilizing the joint, which leads to increased risk. And then trunk dominance, which leads to this increased lateral trunk motion and trunk sway. So what we've done in our prospective cohort studies is we've shown that we can actually predict the risk of relative injury in young female athletes. Those athletes, so we test them biomechanically in the lab, track them out over their season, and show that those that go on to an ACL injury have about eight to nine degrees more valgus or more knee abduction, and about 10 degrees less, less flexion. Again, a multi-planar predictive algorithm. And if you see the X's here, those X's are the young females that go on to a second ACL injury and what this, or a first ACL injury, and what this shows us, all this is, is that knee abduction angle at initial contact. And what it shows us is this is a good predictor. And not only that, maybe half of these young females are at relative risk for an ACL injury. So. Again, what are the neuromuscular imbalances? This is them. And even if we look at, at a sport that's very different, this is, she's coming down, watch her left, watch her trunk, watch her glutes. There's not, there's not the activation there to stabilize the joint. And what you get is that left ACL rupture, even in a sport like wrestling. Very different sport, same exact mechanism. And whatever sport you look at, this is very common on how these injuries happen. These, these young females, whether it's team handball, even someone who is exquisitely uh, talented at controlling their center of mass, um, even someone who, who can do that is, is, um, Okay, even someone like that is, is at relative risk. So if we, if we look at it in the laboratory, if we look at it in the laboratory, what you see is this combination of, of movements and what we can do is correct those movements. So critical analysis and feedback are absolutely uh, critical to, and this is an athlete who has just ruptured uh, multiple ligaments in his knee, dislocated his knee, and just slight movement of his center mass relative to the center of the knee joint leads to an adducting torque, which puts it, pushes his hip and knee joint outward. So this is, once the passive restraint strengths are compromised, the neuromuscular restraints take over, but m both systems need to work in conjunction. This is a series of studies we did with a group at Yale which shows how important 
important trunk proprioception is when these athletes on this on this movable uh, motor driven stool uh, try to reproduce the position of their trunk those that are not good especially if they're young female athletes don't have if those that have error in their trunk proprioception have greater risk of knee ligament and acl injury we showed in a cohort of about 300 athletes and if you look at if you look at the injury mechanism again whether it's a young female athlete an nba player this lack of life. We did a whole series of studies showing the connection between lateral trunk lean and knee valgus as the ground reaction force from the foot tracks the movement of the center of mass and that ground reaction force goes lateral to the hip and the knee, again, creating an, a hip adducting moment, a distal tibial abducting moment, the hip and the knee cave in with that common triplanar mechanism and rupture the ACL. So how do we get at primary prevention? Well, we start out with just simple tools like wall jumps, and then we move into more active dynamic tasks. And there's a problem during growth and development is because with growth, you get longer levers, longer tibia, longer femur, you've got higher forces, and the center of mass comes off the ground. And that combination, what you need is a, is a power spurt to match those longer levers and higher forces. And in general, females don't get that. And when you don't get that from the lack of a testosterone spurt, you get this decreased relative knee muscle strength and recruitment, decreased neuromotor control, increased that dynamic valgus, increased joint load, and increased injury risk. So what what we've been doing for some time is identifying these young females who are at increased risk using 3d biomechanics when her tibia and femur go above go red they're above the threshold of increased load and increased risk so what we do is we use this drop vertical jump test and we do side-by-side -side studies of 3D biomechanics and then simple 2D video. And what we can do is then identify athletes and risk stratify those at a higher risk so that we can target training. Here is a, a risk algorithm with, that we developed with tibia length, so long lever, increase valgus motion on one knee, on the left knee, relatively stiff landing, so very limited, only 55 degrees of knee range of motion, mass, body mass increases risk, and relatively high quad dominance, quad activation relative to ham. What that does is this shows us this individual from 2D video and a dynamometer, 97% risk of high loads, actual joint loads and when we look at the actual loads with 3d biomechanics what we see is they're at almost 50 newton meters which is almost double our 25 newton meter cutoff for risk the good news is meta-analyses have repeatedly showed us in female athletes that we can reduce the risk of acl injuries by between a half and two-thirds so again how do we do that how do we make the female athletes ACL less vulnerable to injury? Well, we address the mechanism. This knee abduction problem we address with biomechanics and technique, low flexion with power and relative increased ham, hamstring and glute recruitment, single leg, a lot of balance and symmetry work, and the foot away from the center mass core stability work. So plyometric training and biomechanical analysis and technique were common components of every study that effectively reduced the risk of ACL injury, especially in female athletes. Some people have claimed that this is a, a positive publication bias, but that's not the case. This is a German study that did a funnel plot analysis. First thing this study shows is 
This is that two thirds risk reduction. And what you see is all these studies hug very close to this line showing that this is a valid relative risk reduction. And all of the studies fall within the funnel that show this is not a positive publication bias. So Kate Webster and I did this study that we published in JOR a couple years ago. And what we showed was the exact same thing we showed 20 years prior in our 1990 AJSM paper, all ACL risk reduction reduced by 50% non-contact ACL injuries in female athletes reduced by two thirds. And this has gained a lot of attention. And this, this study included 15 meta-analyses. So it was an umbrella analysis. So how do we take this data that we know works and move on and make this effective? Technique, plyometrics, dynamic balance, dynamic core and strength training. So our techniques, 5P, biomechanics, plyometrics, dynamic balance, core stability, perturbation control. What the meta-analysis, the earlier meta-analysis that we did with 12 studies that again shows relative risk reduction of non-contact ACL injuries, especially in female athletes by two thirds. This is the most important message I have for you here today. How do you make the ACL less vulnerable? The problem with distal tibial abduction, biomechanics and technique training, low flexion plyometric power, activating the hamstring and the hip musculature, especially relative to the quad, single leg on a flat foot, a lot of balance and symmetry work using the foot as a rocker to decrease the relative force and dynamic core and strength stability training to increase uh, relative control of the trunk. And I'm going to argue if neuromuscular training can increase neuromuscular control of the joint and decrease knee and ACL risk, these mechanisms are neuromuscular in nature, which means they are modifiable. So again, there's overwhelming evidence for the triplanar uh, injury. This is Shea Ralph, who was one of the best players in the NCAA. This, she, this is her third ACL tear. She went on to six ACL tears and reconstructions, which is a major, major problem. This is our prospective study of the risk of a second ACL injury. And basically what we did is we looked for these neuromuscular imbalances in a younger, this is a younger female primarily population from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. The ACL is a pro, a proprioceptor. It's richly innervated. What happens after ACL rupture? Is the sensor gone? Does it ever return? My hypothesis is that physical therapists and athletic trainers are developing extra articular controllers, parallel circuits to control that joint. And when it's not properly controlled, what this leads into is sensory function perturbations and downstream risks of second injury, joint dysfunction, post-traumatic OA. Again, a young, primarily female cohort here we published this data that we showed after a year, about a quarter risk of a second ACL tear, and after two years, about a third of a risk. When we published that, people questioned it, but then the groups from Australia, Julian Feller, Kate Webster, who do very large number of ACLs, Leo Koncheski in Sydney, showed the exact same data. It's between a quarter and a third risk of a second ACL tear. So we kept following our athletes over time to see what the risk predictors for a second ACL tear. And basically hip internal rotation moments and knee abduction motions were the predictors. This is a hip internal rotation moment. If you see the, the red, uh, graph is those that go on to a second tear. This is the zero line. So those that don't go on to a second tear have a net external rotation moment. They're using the hip musculature, the glutes to externally rotate the hip. Whereas those that go on to a second injury actually have a 
are actually letting the ground reaction force internally rotate their hip. And this is a net hip internal rotation moment. These are those that go on to a second ACL tear. Just that alone can predict with about 80% sensitivity and specificity. This is Aaron Davis, rupturing his ACL frontal plane. Again, what you see is this combination of extended leg landing on a flat foot and watch from the frontal plane, just what I told you, you get this combination of internal hip rotation impulse and VA deduction, which leads to tearing of the crack. This is IRG3, even with a brace on, hip internal rotation impulse combined with abduction leads to rupture. This was prior to this season at the NFL Combine. He's asked to do a max forward broad jump, and he actually activates. I call this a dynamic valgus. Uh, people who actually use their musculature in a way that put them at relative risk of these motions and these torques. So again, high risk of uh, this age is a predictor. So the younger and more active the athlete, the greater the risk they have. So we're looking for these athletes, we're screening for athletes that show this, this dynamic valgus motion. And what we showed was those that have that hip internal rotation impulse at eight times greater risk of a second injury, 2D frontal plane valgus three and a half, side to side differences in sagittal plane activation, one quad dominant, one more posterior chain dominant, three and a half, and then a stiffening knee strategy on balancing, two and a half. And all four of those factors together could predict with 94% accuracy who was going on with this, using this receiver operating curve. 92% sensitivity, 88% specificity with an overall C statistic of a 94% prediction rate of second injury. So we're screening for these athletes to look and see who's at relative risk. Basically, these athletes have a very different balancing profile. So we're looking at young female athletes and we're asking her to keep her face equidistant from that rectangle as it moves forward and away from her. And what we show from this data is that normal athletes, we, we actually have them bring a matched control they go from the slow speed to a faster speed. They actually go from uh, completely in phase to 180 degrees out of phase between their hip and their ankle. Whereas those that have an ACL rupture and reconstruction, they lock down the joint. They actually have a different pattern. And then those that are going to go on to a second ACL injury at slow speed, they have higher variability, 180 degrees out of phase. And at fast speed, they can't control and sense the joint. So they actually lock down the degrees of freedom and show a stiffening of the joint. And that's also predictive. If you look at this, normal athletes haven't had an injury. The, the sinking of the lower extremity joints is very continuous and very linear. Whereas those who, that have had the ACL reconstruction and don't sense that joint as well, that linearity and continuity breaks down. And here's someone who's going to go on to a second ACL tear. Complete breakdown of the sinking of the lower extremity joints and the control of those forces. So the outcomes after ACL are challenging and they're questionable. And basically what we're doing is adding in targeted neuromotor training to those risk prediction factors, those four components of ACL injury risk, this hip internal impulse. And, and this is what we do, this combined addressing the trunk and lower extremity, independent and combined exercises, phase-based progressions. So we progressively add degrees of freedom, volume, speed, perturbations, and we can make sure that the athlete has proper neuromotor control before they're progressed. So again, this is a tearing rupturing of the ACL of the ground. This happens way too often. What you see is combination, ligament dominance, leg dominance, and quad dominance. 
things. Those need to be corrected before they go out on the court. So how do we do that? This First, we start out with lateral jumping progression through multiple phases to control that hip internal in, rotation impulse and that knee abduction through five phases. We start proximally and work distally controlling the trunk above the hip and the knee. And we use our preventive biomechanics approaches to reduce the risk of injury. Those two students of mine I showed you in the beginning, Cardi and uh, Carmen and Katie, we have looked at the genetic pedigree. We've, we've collected blood off the entire living cohort. This is Carmen and Katie, twin girls. If you go up one generation, this is their dad. He's a triplet. All three triplet boys have bilateral ACL injuries. We've got all their genetics and we're looking at what the genes are that predict relative risk. Here are my female athletes that inspire me, my mother and my six sisters, the best female athletes that I know. We've written a, a book on this and all the, the proceeds for this book go to the AOSSM to uh, study ACL injury risk reduction. I wanna thank you for the, your time this morning. And I want to thank a whole lot of people that did a lot of work on these studies over the past two decades. And I'm happy now to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim, for this great presentation and great summary over the last 20 years. I would like now to invite uh, the four, uh, the other for, for experts here in the table so that we can have some discussion and questions also to team and also for the audience if anyone has a question. So could the please uh, Eva Ferrer, Marta Guillén, Susan Hurman and Ramon Cugat sit on the table and we will discuss also with Tim Hewitt. So the first question, um, actually in a continuation, I would like to ask Tim Hewitt about the specific practical application of what he taught us. Uh, so initially my question was about what were the most important things that you would consider in a preventive program, but I think you answered already this, this, this question with your talk. So the question would be a little bit different. So here in Spain, we have a huge amount of ACL injuries. Mutualidad Española de Futbolistas is taking care of all of them, and it's thousands of them. But sometimes, because many of these injuries, as we have seen in previous talks, were in a matter uh, soccer players, so sometimes they complain in the, in the clubs, they complain about lack of time to implement preventive programs. Of course, they can complain about lack of you know, um, education about it, but we can fix this. But how about lack of time? So one question I would like to ask is, in terms of practical application of what we have seen. So to decrease all these aspects, the knee valgus, the, the, the flexion angles, to load in higher flexion angles, the trunk control, everything. So in terms of practical application, how much sessions per week do you think we should apply for how long time? Because sometimes we have limited training time in soccer. So we need to implement probably a very effective and go straight to the point to like to be realistic because we cannot modify the whole thing probably so in terms of how how many time per session and how many times per week and what exercises which this i think you you can answer from the talk but the other two questions that we can recommend our teams in spain to decrease the number of acl injuries in the amateur level i don't know if it makes sense my question yeah it, it does it makes perfect sense um Yes. The, so first of all, I think the important point is, is good, good performance training is good preventive training. So they should be the same thing. So if, if you incorporate into the performance training, the preventive training, then you've saved yourself a lot of time. 
but we've we've done those studies you've talked about minimum minimum of two times per week minimum of 10 to 15 minutes per training session again if it's incorporated into the performance training itself you save yourself time mm -hmm. thank you so uh, translating the question to the team physicians susan hurman and eva ferrer so do you think this is well of course in your you 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 take care of elite teams you know but in terms of in general like do you think this is enough um done like what he was saying about two or three times per week 15 and then incorporate into the training do you think is currently being done in mo in most of the amateur teams and most of the professional teams in your opinion what is your sense about this mm, i think um in professional teams i think so because you have quite longer sessions that amateur you don't have to be just looking at clicking the clock because the next team is coming in and the next team and the next team so probably the professionals because they are more aware because the when they have a, a player that you lose because she has an acl injury you get more involved so you get more worried and you give more time to it but i think that amateurs is lacking we're lacking time there one because we don't have time for the pitch the, the pitch is is uh, rented for a lot of of different teams there's no time for each of them females and males there's a great question here not all females have the same time as male and that's it that's a reality um big teams that have amateur teams are already introducing that part of the work in the training sessions but the ones that are not big corporation or big teams i think that we're lacking their time of course not knowledge not knowledge because the professionals know about it of course at time mm -hmm. yeah i completely agree with it i think the professional teams are doing really well um although sometimes it's also still a point of attention but uh it's more the amateur teams and when you work in a big club they they will have the infrastructure they will have like the the knowledge and the the people who can implement it really easy in the, um, the trainings and the, the, the rehab part, um, but especially yeah the the amateur teams. Um, it's what Eva said. It's not the lack of knowledge because everybody knows it, but we know also about research. Big research, they don't do it. Mm. So time wise and also um, how to implement it in a simple way because like tim is telling us two times uh, a week for like 10 50 minutes it's like nothing if you implement it in your uh, warming up mm -hmm. yeah it looks like for this amount minimum amount of time plus the whatever you do in the training it seems that it can be implemented you know it's a question probably of being conscious about it you know maybe you have to start thinking about making some rules to make this mandatory kind of because uh, you know it doesn't seem to be undoable. I don't know your your experience, your opinion about that. I think that screening is also important. We get to the point that you're going to implement that, but do you know how they come, how how they are before they start? So screening should be worldwide available from the amateurs and from the professionals, and that's a step that we have to do before. So we have to introduce it, but. What about the screening? Mm -hmm. Tim, I think that you're, yeah, you're not, you're saying yes, he, right? He agrees, he agrees. Thumb up. Agree thumb with up. me? Absolutely agree. Screening is absolutely critical for, for risk stratification and to, to get an idea of who is at increased risk, what their profile looks like, and then targeting their training towards those individuals. And those individuals will be more likely to do the training because they have the risk factors. And, and again, a big part of it is ed screening is then follow up education and awareness. Really crucial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then I have, have another question for the um, team physicians regarding the menstrual cycle, hormonal and everything. Okay, because we've talked a lot about this, but in terms of practical application, how do you change if you change according for example if your 
athlete takes oral contraceptive pills or not, for example, or according, I mean, do you, do you adapt it? Do you change it according to whatever supposed calendar phase, despite we don't know for sure, despite we don't have still the blood thing, but how do you change it if, if, if do you do any change? Also for the oral contraceptive pills, for any of you. Um, so the question is specific for if you, if one specific day, one specific training, or more days if you take a player out or you do a just, just for example, a training? Yes, or, or if you modify the training according if they are taking the pills or not, for example, mm -hmm. or according to if they have the menstrual cycle, do you, do you, do you change anything and what? At the moment, what we do is just um, collecting a lot of data because we know there is a lot of research done, but it's not so conclusive. And then is the, f the question, um, which phase is the player? We also don't know because we don't do the blood analysis because what Eva said, we cannot take blood every day from them. So we try to collect as much as possible with all the, the questionnaires, all the um, the information we can get from them with the symptoms. We use this ring a lot to track also like the temperature and they, they are really accurate. Um, but at the moment, it's like um, we have the wellness and sometimes you take a player out, but it's not because they are on day X of the menstrual cycle. It's because they don't feel well, because they have symptoms. They are, it's a combination of everything. It's not that we take a player out just because of it's day this of the cycle. That's what, how we do it. Uh, because we still think we don't know enough about exact the cycle where they are in and the risk factors. Mm -hmm. There's a point too. Uh, individual sports, very easy. You just train depending on the day if you need to. You are just one. And the other fact is the coach and the technical staff. So we just said, okay, she's in ovul ovulation phase. It, she doesn't need to you know, shoot more. And then the coach said, okay, but today is the day that we need to shoot because tomorrow, the next, the next day, we play or there's a final. So are you going to have a player in the bench because she's ovulating? It doesn't make any sense. No? So first of all, we, we need more research and then we, to understand what the player needs. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. So Dr. Aleix Pons is, going, is one of our faculty members in Institute Kuwait. He will help in the discussion as well. Yes. Dr. Pons. Uh, First, have you any question about, yeah? No. Okay. Later, I, I do some questions. Thank you. More than a question, it's a, a comment of uh, personal experience. Some years ago, we did a program of uh, prevention of hamstring injuries, uh, working on core stability and doing some exercises and on two amateur rugby teams. And the conclusion was that if you don't get the coach on site to actually get the players to do the exercises, it just doesn't happen. So I think it's important to work on the coaches. Any more questions? No? I have one question about the surgeries. Um, after, uh, what do you think about the reconstructions of Lemers in a primary reconstruction uh, for a young athlete, uh, professional? Do you think that it's correct? And what changed the protocol of rehabilitation? I think, uh, I think not everybody needs uh, anterolateral reconstruction. Depends the clinical uh, study. When you test, you can see how is the uh, Lachman test and how is the anterior draw and the pivot shift. But I think when we have a huge, large pivot shift, yes. But a few cases, I think, that the first time is necessary Lemaire. The most common, I think, is when, when the, and the girls, as uh, uh, Dr. Pedro Alvarez explained, I think uh, for prevent another injury, maybe it's fine because prevent the movement of the valgus and the varus is prevented, but not the, val not the valgus. And I think, I think the most important is to have a good, good fitness. And then I think one question is very important because it's similar loop, the semi-T. 
and we need to see if the first time this soccer player has been operated by Simiti, Simiti and Gracilis because I think it's a wonderful stop because if the, the women's are a weakness and the soft tissue and then in some moment of the menstrual cycle has more uh, laxity of the anterior cruciate ligament and then the stop we have in the uh, all the the padua hmm? uh, if there is not semity and rectus femoris it's more easy to go to valgos i think we need to study very well indications for us is more secondary or third or four five times acl yes sure and then primary only if you have a knee is too tight don't need it and needs to see if it's some other injury combined maybe if it's the anterior uh, plus medial collateral and sometimes the capsule and the posterior or posterior lateral but if no not, not necessary i think Yes, I, I totally agree. I, I think that uh, the problem now is that uh, to have a decision about this, you have to explore the knee. And sometimes we, we, we expect that the MRI give us the, the indication. That's the problem. The only question is to explore the knee, to know the patient. In the professional teams, we have the, uh, something very important that is the medical team that knows the knee of the patient, of the player, and know how it is. And this, this is something that we don't know in all the other patients that has not a doctor that know the knee. And sometimes to know if it's the dominance, if, if you are a basketball player and you are right hand, uh, the left knee needs more stability than the right knee. But those are things, and of course, the meniscus tear, if you have a lateral meniscus, uh, it works always, with or without the mare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dr. Hewitt, what, what's your opinion about having less uh, dynamic stabilizers in terms of uh, the hamstrings, gracilis and, and semity, in terms of anterior displacement and actually valgus uh, control? Yeah, it's... Uh, First of all, I should say we, we've done a few meta-analyses on the question of laxity and the female cycle. So we did a meta-analysis looking at laxity. Is, is there actually more laxity across the cycle? During the ovulatory phase, about day 14, 15 of a 28-day cycle, yes, the laxity goes up, but it's just a little bit less than a millimeter. So the laxity is small increase at ovulation. But then when you look at when injuries clump, they're exactly the opposite end of the cycle, day zero. So laxity may not be a predictor of injury. So that there, there may be a disconnect and it is, as the physicians pointed out, it, it's complex. It's in, in my opinion, so, so women overall tend to be more quad dominant and when they do use their hamstrings more, they tend to be lateral hamstrings dominant. Taking their medial, medial hamstrings for a graft is not a good idea because they need that. They, they underutilize those muscles and those muscles should be developed and um, activated more and strengthened more rather than utilizing them for a graft. I, I think, uh, this is, I, I think the randomized control trials, the multi-center center trials show that in women, hamstrings grafts stretch out more than they do in men. Although they stretch out in both, they stretch out more in women and they, they fail more in women. So a quad dominant individual who underutilizes medial hamstring not a good idea to take that semi-tendinosis and gracilis as a graft. I, I think it leads to 
stretching out, and I think it leads to increased risk of re rupture. And and I think the data well, supports that position. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. A question to the panel: uh, If there is one athlete with the MCL. Uh, tear, uh, but not very important, grade one and ACL combined. Uh, in this case, do you prefer uh, cold uh, the knee for uh, 20 days, uh, one month, starting with the uh, rehab program, or uh, do you prefer starting with the surgery as soon as possible? Thank you. Normally, uh, when we have an uh, injury of the medial collateral ligament plus ACL, uh, the idea is to uh, go to the surgery room. Three concepts. No pain, good range of motion, and no uh, swelling the knee, not wooden the knee, as blood or uh, synovial. Uh, and then needs to take care because when there is an anterior crucial ligament plus medial, normally the most common is the injury in the epicondyle or the uh, fraction of the meniscal femoral ligament, the deeper, the deeper part of the, the ligament. And then create a st instability at the 20, 30 degrees of flexion. In this case, I think in our hands, we are using in the physical therapy. They help too much to us and try to get good range of motion, less inflammation and less pain. And we have about 120 degrees. We are ready to go to the surgery room. In this case, we do it normally if it's a total rupture or it's the most common is a partial rupture. In this case, we use ACL, uh, reconstruction with patella tendon, the most common, and then we inject growth factor, growth factors, PRP, the fraction rich on platelets, not poor in this case. That is our idea, our job. In our experience, uh, we, we do it in acute. We don't wait to, to be cool, the, the, knee, the knee, and we have not evidence uh, between the in our series that we have until uh, 2009 we have 60,000 uh, 6,000 sorry 6,000 of cases of ACL reconstruction and we have no difference. I have uh, another question uh, about the return to play. Uh, the difference between the, the males and females it's in, on in all the publications says that it's later. What do you think that is the most uh, the most important important factors to explain the difference between that? Anatomical, biomechanical, uh, hormonal, there are multitude of factors, but we need to control previously to return to play. I think after one surgery of the ACL, the most important is good stability, then no effusion, and good muscle control as hamstrings and quadriceps and then the player stay in the in the field in the pitch walking running jumping all and we can do test as tensiomyography uh, test of the the general comb general rope all these uh, devices but one of the most important is psychological how is the girl is ready to go back to play? And normally uh, we like to ask, how you feel? Are you ready to go to the beach, running, jumping, cutting? And she, she say, she explained yes or no. If she said yes, go ahead if no wait and maybe continue stretching maybe the all the neuromuscular and more preparation physical preparation you need to get fitness to do football never do football to get fitness thank you 
Sorry. Uh, about this, I, I, I think that uh, when the patient needs to return to play, uh, first it needs to to superate the the joint. Lesion. Then they need to superate the mind, the mind lesion, the brain. And the problem sometimes is that you have a patient that was has an ACL reconstruction by uh, because of an skill lesion, and you ask him, and maybe he's not skiing, but he's, he's making a football match every week because in football was not the lesson. And the problem for him is to put the skis and to go to the snow. And in the other side, the same. I think that something is very curious. About female and male, um, of course, we have the hormonal profile, but the hormonal profile will be the same before the injury than after, or hopefully. We don't know, but probably it will be the same. Um, of course, there are the risk factors. And one of the biggest that I think that we should focus in, in females is neuromuscular control. So Azara was talking about it. And really, I think that there's a difference between male and female. Uh, we need to focus more on that and make females understand that we need to train and focus a little bit more than males that area uh, but from since the beginning we have to focus since they are little and if of course if they get injured we have to focus a little bit more but i think that that can make a difference between one one type of player and the other you have a question there yeah uh, joseph Berziès from the Statistics foundation international well first of all I really enjoyed this morning, uh, you know, the, 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 the symposium. Congratulations from, uh, you know, the organizers, uh, Professor Ramon Cugat and all the team and also Mehdi and all the, and all the speakers. My question is the following, is that uh, we spoke during all the morning about the, the probably the, the how can improve these kind of problems, no? My question is very easy, you know, but probably difficult to answer, no, is that when they finish with this woman, they finish the uh, the football, you know, activity. Because we don't forget that the OA is a woman disease you know, and it's a genetic issue. What do you recommend? How can prevent the early osteoarthritis in this kind of women? What do you recommend? Counter protection? What do you recommend? Because you know it's it's well published that uh, you know these kind of problems can you know, produce early osteoarthritis, no? That the thing is very important issue. And we have, we have a lot of uh, patients, you know, in, in the OAFI with that, no? Uh, even young, young, young women players, no? For the ski, for others that they have these kind of problems and they become with a early osteoarthritis soon. That means that uh, I think it's very important to, to understand and to help to the players, but at the same time to the, this woman that when they live to be players, no? What do you recommend? Counter protection? What kind of things, what kind of activity do you recommend in order that to avoid any prothesis in, 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 early, in early stage? Thank you. I, I have to say that I don't believe too much in counter protection, uh, but uh, the most of the patients that came to the, to the office uh, have it. And I say always, if you are better having you, if I will be you, I will continue, but it's just symptomatic more than, because the, the doses that you need to, to, to have of collagen or whatever, to be in the joint in the, in the necessary doses, we don't know. You never know if it's really, is real, the effect. Yeah, so and after an ACL we were talking about, they will get it sooner or later because the trauma was already there, so the damage is done, but we can try to protect it, of course. Um, but we still say keep active, um, do activity, but again, the Nina must not get swollen, all kind of things, and really important also to continue with all the, the prevention work for the secondary prevention. Um, so they have to stay active, stay training, and depends on the knee, of course, what kind of uh, exercise is the best. For example, running and the impact, maybe not, depending on the, where is the, 
the lesion, um, but biking, and we like it a lot in the Netherlands, is really good, for example. So uh, that's what we always advise them, but always stay active, pre secondary prevention, and um, yeah, the symptoms of the knee have to be calm. Well, thanks. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time because it's now time for the players. Yes, sorry. I'd like to answer <laughs> to, my, to my friend, okay? I think when the player uh, is finishing, the majority we have injuries in the cartilage. And normally, as you said, the majority goes to the osteoarthritis and we need to prevent. I think sometimes the, for me is one very important to reduce the weight, not increase the weight. Continuous doing exercise. Good range of motion, flexion, extension, the hips, the ankle, the knee. And then uh, one exercise I recommend to strengthen hamstrings and quads. And range of motion of hip and hip and, and uh, knee and ankle. And then I think it's a very, very interesting thinking the, in the cartilage, there are a lot of uh, hyaluronic acid chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine and sometimes I think can help and nowadays we are using a lot of biologics our experience has been 21 years using biologics and help very much one two injections per, per year after they stop uh, doing football that is, uh, we have this uh, recept, okay? That's uh, our advice, prevent. Because if no, uh, everybody knows all the people perform football or a matter, large period of time or professional normally goes to the uh, osteoarthritis and sometimes total knee or total hip replacement that is so common, okay? And we need to try to help on at least delay these kind of problems. Because when we have uh, ACL, the osteoarthritis increase. When we have ACL plus medial or lateral meniscus, increase a lot of, it's quicker. Short, in a short time, we can have a big uh, osteoarthritis. I think we need to take care. And for us, uh, if it's possible to protect the lateral meniscus, that is the most important because for and the football, we have many problems when we have a lateral meniscus tear and we need to uh, remove. The idea is try to suture, but sometimes it's not possible. That is our, our philosophy. I don't know, Tim? Yeah, so yes, I, I agree. With everything you say, you, you uh, swelling is important. I think the the biologics are leading in the right direction. We need more data. Uh, the the uh, nutraceuticals, chondroitin, uh, works for some. So I, I I agree with everything you say. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. We have no time for more. And now there is another uh, view, point of view from the soccer players, the actual soccer players. So we will have a great experience. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing. Thanks, team, for joining us. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you. Thank you. Sí, las contras tengo aquí yo. Venga, chicas, al podium, al podium. Ah, no tengáis vergüenza. Let's go. Let's go to the escenario.
Sara está, sí, sí, Sara está por aquí. Se está re... Ha estado en una entrevista. Espera, pues ahora echa usted. Oír, ¿eh? Oír, reír. Estamos en casa, estamos en casa. We play at home, no, no outside. So for us it's a very pleasure to, to contact with you. Thank you very much for come here uh, for this meeting. And I introduce is Clara Cos. She's, she's a soccer player, she's a amateur soccer player playing now in uh, San Gabriel, but playing in Europe. The, the last year, he says uh, ACL surgery. Bruna, Bruna Vilamala, he is uh, the first team of the Barcelona. He has uh, two, so, two ACL surgeries, one in when he is more young. He, she is very young, but in the 16 years performed the first. Uh, Marta Turmo, she plays in, is also a, so, a professional soccer player, plays in Real Club Deportivo Español. And Sara Merida, Sara Merida is an uh, ex-professional uh, soccer player, now is a physio, is a retrainer, and now is also a trainer. So he has all, all, all of point of views. So the, the idea is the, in this round table is relaxing, is not the first, relaxing. Is sometimes you, you can to speak in, in Spanish, no problem, so my English is worse than yours, so sure. So the, the first question for, for, for all of you, um, all of you uh, have uh, suffered ACL uh, injuries in your sports career. More of you very young, very young. So the, I have two questions. The first, uh, how did the ACL injury influence in your life? The first question. And the second question is, uh, what was is that worried you the most? Uh, what you want to start? Um, first, I would like to begin by thanking for this invitation because I'm really glad to be here and to be participate in this event focused in female ACL. Thank you so much. The injury influenced me mainly in a psychological way because I didn't realize how serious it was. It affected me on a personal level since I had, have never suffered any injury like this before. In addition to feeling separate from my team without being able to do what I like the most in my day-to-day -day life. The relation and acceptance sense of the seriousness of what was going on was difficult to overcome. What worried me the most was realizing that this injury will last more than two weeks. It's not a simple injury. It's in a fact long lasting one which extends time to fix it. The fear of having a surgery for the first time, the fear of facing such a long road in which the user table of it be able to get back at the performance level, I was before the injury, all that worries me a lot. Um, um, from my point of view, um, the first LCA um, uh, was the one that influenced me the most because um, the whole recovery process made me gain a different perspective of life and I learned um, how to value what I already had and what I already accomplished. And after my first LCA, um, when I came back, um, I was more motivated than ever to do my best every single day and, and enjoy um, every moment. And about the things that worried me the most, um, I think it were um, all these questions that no one really know the answer, like um, how I'm gonna be back or how I'd be confident to play again and all these things. But in the two LCA injuries, um, during the process, I see uh, like you start to see how the knee is fine and it's stable. So that really helps. And when I came back also um, for the first LCA injury, um, I was exactly the same player I used to be, so um, hopefully this time will be the same. Marta. So what helped me the, to realize the first the, the injury was to to give value to the, the, the nutrition, the the training, the the hours you put into work, and you don't realize how important they are. And 
it helped me the, to approach a, a different way to, to the practice. So a lot of players go there and train and they don't know what they have. And when you are injured and you are a part of the team, you, you realize that these times are, are uh, all you, you want to have as a, as a player. And you just keep away from, from a while to, to be ready to play again. And the, the concern that I have was why did it happen to me? Why, like, I train a lot, I take care of my nutrition, I give importance to things that other players don't, and why it happens to me when I go, when I can play again, when I can run, when, when I can be a player again? And these questions that, as Bruna said, uh, you don't have the answer and it's difficult to, to find it. You have to keep in your house, like be hours thinking, why did this happen to you? What did what did you do wrong, and how you can improve these little moments? And it is hard to to overcome these these little things. In first time, uh, sorry for my English. Okay, thank you. Um, for me, that uh, no have more things that my partner. So uh, my first injury only with uh, 15 years. So uh, you know, conscient that you all think that important for the soccer. So I'm only a uh, thing in what happened, no? Uh, change uh, day to day my life. Uh, I'm focused uh, only in my studies and the training. So one day uh, in my house, uh, your leg up, uh, I can't uh, walking. I can't uh, do anything. No, so I don't know what happened. No, uh, and it's very difficult for me in this time. And I need uh, help uh, to my family, uh, a professional's uh, psychology, and more, more months. I think what happened. No, I don't understand. In in my time, ten years ago, I don't have uh, anything professional along. No, together me all time. So only my family. And more difficult for me uh, start to the recovery, uh, to the recovery. Sorry, but I don't know uh, who will start. No. Another question for for all of you. All of you. Uh, what has helped you the most to overcome the injury? First, my family, because day after day, you next to me, supporting me in every way. Uh, and could um, be in my side during the difficult moments, especially my sister, who was there when I was diagnosticated the ACL ruptor and one of the worst moments of my life. Um, also, Pedro Alvarez gave me all his thoughts and calm constantly. Lucia, physical trainer, and Dani, physiotherapist from the football team Europa, were my guys during my rehabilitation. I learned a lot from them. and. And they taught me a lot of things I never had importance to. I started appreciating them greatly. Most important, however, my way of facing the injury, my day and my strength. Training session after training session to bring out of myself and using everything in my control to be able to recover it in the best way possible. Um, I believe that the things that have helped me the most to overcome the two LCA injuries um, have been the relationship I have with my medical staff in the club and also with um, Pedro. Um, but I also believe that the help from psychologists um, has been vital, in, especially in my second one. Um, from my point of view, um, since it's a long time recovery process, it's harder, I believe it's harder to manage uh, mentally than physically. So the psychologist part um, has been really important for me. For me, the most important was my mentality. I think this is a key point um, of my recovery. Instead of, setting, instead of thinking when I would play again or when I would run or when I would, could do other things, I was setting little goals and thinking, okay, so in two weeks, I'm gonna start doing different exercise. And I'm, I reward myself uh, every time I accomplish a little goal, I said, okay, let's do the, the next one. And step by step, instead of thinking in six months, I would, be a, I would be a player again. No, I just set little goals and accomplish them. And sometimes uh, talking with Pedro Alvarez, I wish I did a lot of tests of my hamstring, of my quad, the strength that I have. 
I would love to to have a test to can test our mentality, how how men mental strong you are, and how the young players can can improve this and can work on this because this is fundamental to to overcome an injury like this. Um, the most important for me, uh, my family, of course, uh, the Kuga team, very important for me that uh, 10 years ago, again, uh, I'm only in the club, okay? So only uh, together with me, the Kuga team and my family. So uh, the same with Marta Turmo, uh, where I am, I'm a person, uh, a stumber person, and only thing in play again. Thank you. So now, now is a question to to Bruna. So Bruna, uh, you were injured very young, and a few months ago, for the second time, as a professional and having success in your club and national team. Uh, what do you think when you injured yourself for the second time? Um, so honestly, when I broke my LCI for the second time, I just um, couldn't believe it. Uh, it took me a while to. Um, accepted it because I was wondering, like um, everyone asked, um, like why me, why now? Um, I believe it's never a good time to get injured, especially an injury like LCA. Um, so I need my time to to accept it. Um, but at the end of the day, with the help of my family, my friends, and my teammates, um, I found the strength to say, "Okay, it's happened again. Um, you've done it once, and." You can definitely do it again, and you are going to. So let's just start. Well, thank you. Now is uh, to Clara. Clara, you are belong to amateur soccer player. It's a different as your friends, uh, with fewer economic and material uh, resources in the medical aspect. So the question is, how do you rate the medical help that? Uh, Mutualidad of Catalonia uh, has offered you. Um, without a doubt, it was a really professional treatment. They have an incredible medical team, and I was very lucky to have uh, Dr. Pedro Alvarez give me all his thoughts and confidence. With this confidence, we decided to start a project together about the female ACL, a project mainly based on trying to help, help as many people as possible in both personal and medically to overcome this injury focusing all aspects of the person and the everything that encompasses them. Shortly, we will, we will start the channel where we will explain the project in more detail. Thank you. So, Marta, it's to Marta. Uh, how important is the retrainer in your recovery? I think here is your retrainer. Yeah, for me a lot. <laughs> he is the key piece of my recovery. He was during the ACL recovery. Now I I broke my the patellar tendon, so he's still there for me. And not only as a as a retrainer, as you said, he's all, he's my friend, he's my partner, he's the person who spends more time with me. So I think it's important for the retrainers to understand in what point you are. If you are mental prepared to do a hard trainer, a hard training, or if you just want want to go there and just do a little bit of physiotherapy. Uh, he he also uh, not only coaches me and tells you have to do this kind of exercise or this. He explains why we do the exercise, how the exercise are gonna improve my my recovery, and how are they gonna evolve. So we sometimes we do the the same kind of exercise, but we improve little things that are changing, and when when we are evolving the the recovery. So. For me, as I said before, is the key point of my recovery. I'm lucky to have him as a retrainer, and and I hope um, the players have the the same luck as, as I do. Thanks, thanks, Marta. So now it's uh, to Sara. Uh, uh, Sara, you suffered um, various uh, injuries in your and surgeries in your career. You are now a retrainer and trainer. And how's your vision in the of the injury change it from the you are the player now and, and the new roles? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my time, uh, the most important uh, was do quad, hamstring, all strong, more strong. 
in the uh, retaining coach. So now it's impossible only do uh, quad and hamstring, no? Uh, it's more uh, important, for, for example, stability your hip, your middle glute, the muscles in good uh, longer, no more uh, quadriceps than the ischio, for example, uh, your stability that your angle, uh, so more things, no? Uh, work uh, for me, the most important is work with uh, ¿Cómo es? Variabilidad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ¿Eh? Different exercise. No do uh, two months all time, like extension and your mind in other things and one, two, three. No, no. Uh, you need to uh, do more uh, different uh, uh, movement no? of your knee, of your body. And for me, the most important is uh, actuality. You do a specific movement of the soccer, no? for example, in this, in this meeting. Thank you. Um, now the practice of the female soccer players improve uh, exponentially, no? So the, the last question for me, but if the audience has some question also, I, I invite the audience. But my final question is this. From more uh, experience, what advice would uh, you give your younger soccer players to avoid ACL injuries? What are your advice? Based on my experience, when you have some time um, of pain, no matter how minimal, go to have a diagnostic done precisely because I left a little lot of time before going to the doctor because I was scared um, to face a reality. Last but not less, it is inevitable to have into account importation of nutrition, menstruation, pay attention to professionals, whatever, physical trainers, physiotherapists, also, your individual work, it's imperative, which tends to not be accounted for, but the ultimate is more important. Um, in the end, I think that's injury that um, anyone can't control at all. Um, however, um, they can work on little things to go down the risk, um, like Clara says, um, the diet or the sleep and the whole um, unseen training, I, I think it's really important. And it's um, a couple of easy to to do it, and with all these, with only these things um, work on it, um, you can go down the risk. So I think it's really important. As both of them said, uh, I think it's important to give importance to uh, the diet, the nutrition, the the extra training you can do before uh, practice or after a practice you can stay there and stretch a little bit more um, listen to our bodies. It's important, when we are young, we just go there, play football and don't think of anything else. And I think it's important to listen to your body. When it says to stop, is for a reason. So stop and give a rest is a, a better rest of uh, five days or a week than a month. So, so this, yeah, this is, and the, the most important advice that I would give to, to the young players is to that as technologies and medicine are evolving, I think it's impossible to prevent 100% an ACL rupture. So I think that all of you guys have to be prepared, mentally prepared for when the time comes, if it comes, uh, to, to be able to overcome this injury and be ready to play again. Um. I need to explain in Spanish with this uh, question, please. Perfecto. No, it's important for pues me venga. that this is the future, the little lo puede, wheels. Lo puedes hacer, vale. lo puedes hacer. Gracias. <laughs> y lo siento. Eh, principalmente creo que es súper importante concienciar a las jugadoras. ¿no? En, en mi época era impensable o no éramos conscientes de la... No gravedad, pero bueno, sí, gravedad de, que tienes cuando te lesionas, ¿no? que son mínimo 10 meses fuera. Eh, tienes que tener un trabajo detrás. Creo que es importante incidir en el trabajo presesión, en un trabajo preventivo, en que, como bien ha dicho Marta y mis compañeras, en el que se autoconozcan ellas. ¿no? O sea, al final, por mi experiencia en el español estos años, lo más importante para mí es que las jugadoras supieran en cada momento, en cada ejercicio y en cada gesto y en cada movimiento, qué estaban eh, ejerciendo, que, con qué musculatura tenían que ejercer ese movimiento y de qué manera, ¿no? Entonces, creo que esto ha evolucionado muchísimo, que es súper importante y, y a más, ha crecido aún más todo el tema nutricional, la importancia de la, compos de la composición corporal, 
eh, gestionar las cargas y como bien eh, hemos hablado aquí, eh, saber cuándo hay que parar, cuándo no, pero para eso hay que enseñarles. No nacemos enseñadas con 14, 15 años. Entonces, es muy importante el recurso humano que ha mejorado estos últimos años en el fútbol femenino, el recurso económico que esto hace que la nueva generación eh, sea capaz de llegar mucho más formada para ello. Thank you. <risa> Muchas gracias y yeah. thanks. Uh, es, es, we have uh, two minutes. If uh, some question in the audience uh, for the world soccer players, doctora Eva. The micro, the micro, please. Preparados. Eh? I, I, I just want to make a comment. I want to congratulate all of them and all of the other female players that had, have suffered this injury because it's a problem with their career normally. They have to stop their career. And I think that as a physician, we have to let them breathe, let them understand what's going on with their bodies in that moment. And we have to just sometimes close our eyes, forget we are physicians and be beside them. We have to understand what there's going on in their heads. That's so important for them and for us because we have to be beside them and we have to hear what they say and understand it. So thank you and thank you. Some more, some more question or comments? because we, we are in, on time. If no, no more question, Dr. Kugat, please come on and close it, uh, the symposium. Ah, doc, Dr. Mauri from Manchester City, clap. And well, I would like to add a comment as well, as, as Eva said. 15 years ago, I belong to veterans of Espanol football team. Veterans, it means very, very old. Black and white, okay? Uh, 15 years ago, we played against female football team of Espanol. We, we, we said, what will happen if we play against the female team? Oh, we're going to beat them. And we easily beat them 6-2. I'm pretty sure nowadays, currently, it will be very, very tough to beat them. So I would like to congratulate you because you put the, the female football level here very, very, very close to the, to, to the male. And I'm pretty sure that with this mentality and this quality of, of person and, and, and footballers, it will be very difficult to beat you again. Nothing else. First of all, congratulations, all the four uh, athletes, soccer players, and uh, you explained the real concept, what happened at the soccer players when they have an injury. Perhaps needs to have the injury, and then you can explain, and you can give many advice at the young generations. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. And then <clears throat> I think we arrive at the final of this meeting. I don't know if we, if we get the, the essence and the ideas we, we need it to have. But first of all, I, I would like to thank the members of the uh, Spanish Football Federation we have here in representation a Dr. Elena Herrero. He is coming in name of the our president, uh, Mr. Luis Rubiales. And thank you, thank you very much for this kind uh, help to us. Thank you, Elena. And then uh, we have the three 
very important person in Spain, and I suppose he uh, take the message because I need the support of our uh, general director, Jose Elias Gallegos, and then and the Emilio Escofet and Jose Andres Cruz. And maybe Jose Andres Cruz is very, very important because he's the chief of the sinisters. And ACL is a sinister. And maybe uh, we need to, to speak because from Madrid, you can uh, spread around the Spain this idea, this concept. And because we need to continue working, there's not enough. We need to continue uh, on research. And we have the possibility, because in, uh, in the mutualidad of futbolistas uh, españoles, uh, mutualidad, maybe someone, someone is listening and perhaps they ask, what does that mean, uh, uh, mutualidad? Mutualidad is just an instance company is running parallel to the football federation. And that is the reason because all the soccer players has uh, make an inscription in the football, they have the possibility, uh, we need to attend all the soccer players. I think that is not only for the uh, Catalan delegation, it is for all, all Spanish. We are here representing all Spanish, 21 uh, delegations from all the uh, Spanish territory. And we need to think not only these uh, around 200, we have uh, 200,000 soccer players inscription in Barcelona or in Catalonia. Nowadays, 18,000 uh, female uh, players. But we have close to 1 million in Spain. It's 900,000 or a little more. And I think, I think we need to be clear. We need to help the girls are playing uh, football. We have seen is a big disaster when the rupture of the anterior ligament because later is coming the osteoarthritis and then is a bad solution nowadays in osteoarthritis. I hope maybe in the future we can help uh, these uh, people has the osteoarthritis. And then I need to say thanks uh, Antonio uh, Mr. Antonio Artero is our general director here in, uh, in Catalonia and uh, he cooperates and he works very much to get this even. And I think, I think finally I need to help and to say thank you very much Oscar and all the family here in Spain control the MIDI. And I said, finally, finally, the others is the, our president, Joan Soteras. Today is not possible. And the general manager, and because uh, today have a, um, uh, a football uh, players in some, some area, I don't remember. They, have, they are busy today. Uh, in the morning, in the afternoon, said, please, no, that is the reason yesterday at the, end, at the, at the dinner together uh, and they join, join with us. And finally, I like to say thank you, thank you very much, uh, Klaus, because without MIDI, it was not possible to organize this meeting because MIDI support for many years ago and we have a very, very good relation because sometimes I stay working in Barcelona, in Spain, in Malaga, and sometimes we are visiting Munich. Klaus, thank you. Thank you very much. And take care. Klaus and all his team, more than, I think, uh, 17,000 uh, persons are working for the players. Klaus, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have a little final we close with the
take home message is not here, but for us has been increasing women participation in sports practice. Health is basic for them. It is more important to prevent the injury than to treat it. The risk factors we analyze anatomy, physiology, training, nutrition, resting, and physical and mental health. Oh, thank you. Doesn't <laughs> matter. I have, I have, yeah. And the treatment ACL reconstruction, graft technique, and reinforcement. And return to play, a specific rehabilitation program for the woman. And then the timing. Take care, not quickly. And we need to copy United States 12 months for go back to play. It's the best for, the, for healing the collagen in the uh, graph we insert when we, do the, when we did the, the surgery. And prevention programs are the key. Let's go to Madrid directly to avoid re-rupture and to never suffer an ACL rupture. You need to get fitness to do football. Never do football to get fitness. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, these four girls, wonderful girls. Thank you. Thank you very much.